Hello, everyone. So good afternoon. Uh, I'm very glad to to be here and uh, and uh, and and, and uh, attend this uh, this discussion. So today, uh, I I bring one to uh, bring the top uh, the topic I uh, bring here is per group default domain domain type. So I will first uh, uh, briefly uh, briefly uh, introduce what are the problems we are suffering. And then I, I, I uh, will propose how could we uh, fix it. And then I'd like to discuss the user API. First, uh, what, what are the problems we are uh, suffering? Uh, currently uh, in IOMMU uh, driver, we have a global uh, domain type called IOMMU dev domain type. This is determined by kernel configuration or uh, boot parameters. Uh, and uh, the boot, param uh, boot command parameters will override the kernel, kernel boot, uh, boot configuration. So uh, this uh, causes some problems. Uh, for example, the problem one. So uh, when defo default domain type is DMA, while the users uh, might want, want to, to bypass IMMU for some uh, super speed devices, for, for example, a NIC device uh, for, for performance uh, consideration. So and um, so with current with current IOM driver, uh, we cannot do this. So the uh, the next uh, problem, uh, for example, if the default domain type is identity, but users might want a DMA, uh, might, wa uh, might want want to use DMA for some legacy uh, three two bit devices. So so currently uh, different uh, different. Uh, uh, IOM driver have have different solutions. For example, uh, if we use uh, Intel's IOM driver, we will force uh, we will force uh, DMA for the legacy uh, 32 bit devices. Uh, so more and more users are looking forward to a uh, fine grained default domain type. So this is why I uh, bring this topic to to our discussion. <laughs> Better. Uh, do we have the domain type on Intel or AMD that supports both having a, a remapped region near the bottom for such a bit devices and an offset variant of the full identity mapping near the top, or we don't have that on Intel or AMD? Okay. Because we've had cases of um, interesting devices that tend to move, set the current DMA mask that is smaller than the actual DMA mask, and, they will, and so they want basically 32-bit things for some of the ring resources to save harder resources, uh, but they can deal with full 64-bit addresses for actual data transfers. And, uh, and so effectively something like this will be forced to use your uh, DMA uh, domain. We solve that on some power by effectively having both. Uh, by having a window that is remapped at the bottom and a window that is an offset version of the direct mapping at the top. And, and then it becomes purely a policy to, to decide whether you authorize that second window as a security mechanism or not. It's a bit trickier for guests because the bypass window is dif more difficult to, to create. Uh, but that's not just food for thought. That's something that... Uh, that's been useful. But yeah, continue. Yeah. So, so, so currently, I, I, I think uh, I'm, uh, I'm a implementation doesn't support uh, part of the the, 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 uh, the address to use the dynamic and a part of the doesn't support. So okay. So uh, how can we? Uh, how do we do do it? So. Uh, my my idea my, my proposal is to we split the the, the boot sequence. So currently we uh, during boot we allocate a group and uh, uh, allocate a default dom domain and attach domain to device and then uh, if the attach failed, so I am driver might uh, uh, request a different domain type uh, on attach failure. So 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 now let's move the uh, 
group allocation out of this loop. So first uh, we uh, allocate a group for each device. And uh, at the same time, we de determine the domain type. Uh, so here, we, we, we may be, uh, the domain, domain type may be come from uh, three, three sides. For, for example, the, uh, device, the driver might uh, hard code some, some, some devices for some types of uh, translation. And the may, user may be uh, specify uh, some devices to use uh, some, uh, some, some uh, type. And also we have a default domain type. So the, so the order is driver will override user, uh, user input, and the user input will override uh, the global uh, default value. So after we, uh, so after we, we uh, allocate the group and uh, determine the uh, default domain type, then uh, we allocate the, the domain and uh, attach the domain to device. Just a question to help understand this. Is this, I mean, the stuff on the left sounds like it happens at enumeration time. Is that right? As opposed to driver binding time? Yeah. 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 And that, it, I, I'm not sure you're talking about, I assume you're talking about the driver binding time on the right. Is that true? Uh, so you're, ch you're moving things, proposing moving things from enumeration time to driver binding time? Oh, no. Uh, no? Just uh, just a sp uh, split, sp split one loop your input into two, two loops. Yeah, but it's still, it's still the enumeration. So yeah, so wh and one thing that uh, worried me about what, you, what we to already do today with our in fact, is we have some dependency here on the fact that we have an enumeration passage separate from actually registering with the device model and binding the drivers. Uh, not all buses have that, platform buses don't. Um, which means in non-PCI cases, uh, this is difficult uh, because we don't have a way to have a holistic view of the bus uh, um, until we've started binding drivers. And it does raise a question that could come in and might help us clean up some of the is added hacks we have in, in PCIs, generalize the idea of having a bus which is in non-active state where we add things but we do not bind drivers and we have an activate generic at the device model level uh, mechanism on that said bus where we actually can cross it to the binding. And that will ha help with other cases where we might have some cross dependencies to solve, et cetera. F again, food for thought, something that came to, to me a couple of times in the past and never really did something, anything about it. But we effectively have that in PCI with this is added flag, uh, which has always, I think, been unpleasant, but we just dealt with it. Um, and, and something like this, if we don't want to make it PCI specific, uh, we'll probably want a similar mechanism. Um, yeah, that, that's a problem. Yeah. I mean, this already exists for, for ARM with non-PCI devices, so I'm not sure what's PCI. Are no, I mean, the, the ARM the API. Yeah, there's already two hooks, right? There's the add device and the attach device, and add happens pretty early. But they happen we don't have a mechanism in, in driver core to hooking up a device to a bus without <laughs> triggering the, the driver matching. So we have some hooks, but those are not necessarily called when all of the devices are present yet. And I'm not even getting into hotbed considerations here, but um, this, a lot of what we do in PCI uh, require us to have a view of everything on a given bus before we make decisions about it. Um, it's and actually that's worse. Hotplug makes it a lot worse for Intel because of the way the BIOS tables describe devices. And so we have a first enumeration pass. I don't know if we've properly fixed this to cope with Hotplug because of the way that it lists certain which devices are behind which I.O. in the new. And if they don't exist at the moment because <coughs> that mm. is passed, or it used to be the case, then they, it doesn't get tagged correctly, and it like when it's later hot plugged, yeah, it goes uh, to the wrong it, it, the yeah. So we have another pass for yeah. the Intel one. And the, the PCI pass is uh, allegedly better because in theory, uh, hot plug happens these days at least behind uh, hot plug controls, and so you tend to not have siblings showing up in the pig. But in practice, we do. And particularly the way BIOSes do are things like enabling and disabling random chipset PCI devices uh, and things like this. And so in practice, we do have siblings showing up on an existing bus. 
and so they're going to have to cope with whatever uh, decision we've made for that bus, which is not necessarily uh, can not necessarily be a separate group or domain. So it's a mess. But yeah, uh, uh, to go back to your point, because I'm sorry I'm using up your time. No uh, <laughs> within the existing context of having that pass there, splitting up in two makes sense. Uh, I don't see a problem with that. I'm just more, in, uh, quite in more interested in how do you intend to communicate the <laughs> configuration information from your space to the kernel, and at what point does that happen? Because those pass tend to happen automatically at boot time anyway. So. Uh, short well of the, having your the, device the problem from splitting the default mm. domain type um, attachment from device enumeration is that uh, you lose certain security features. So the the option is that you don't attach the device to any domain and just let it pass through until the, the driver comes around. But then the device has full access to everything. You don't want that. Okay. Um, but allegedly we want to have a domain not that And you, you also can't, can't block the device block the device by default? Yes. Because there, th there might be devices which have RMR regions for the BIOS, USB controllers, for example, oh, or, that's or, other going or, or other devices, uh, like yeah, I so think so some network cars have this too, and some platforms, yeah, so. Is that under control of the firmware until a certain So point? we need to do something with the device at attachment time, uh, at detection time, at enumeration time, yeah. Mm. So. And the question is, um, when you want a per group default domain time at enumeration time at boot, that my, my question is how you want to specify that. Yeah, this is my next term. Okay. Right. So this, so the user is high. So we can introduce to an uh, uh, command uh, option to specify the, so what kind of uh, domain types do you want to, to for some specific devices. For example, the DMA is for the <coughs> DMA mapping and the identity is for the identity mapping. So we find out. Well, the, the, the question is uh, that this could um, give two different default domain types for the same group. You can specify one device in DM, uh, of a group in DMA and one in identity. You, you and specify then the same device? No. Given you have a you have a group with two or more devices and you specify one device in DMA and the other in identity, then yeah, the question is what to do about that. We will detect uh, the conflict and uh, and uh, print the, a message in the uh, kernel message. But I think we, we can use um, first of all we, we needed to tell the user that uh, that uh, a conflict uh, setting has 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 been uh, input. So and then we I think we can use the first the first uh, come first service first. Uh, Oh. <laughs> 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 ben speaks just something. <laughs> 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 so, you can see two of them. You can see uh, come from an argument.
but in a more generic case, it's not really going to, to be practically use, usable, easy to use, or at least not usable. Right, and this is PCR specific. As yeah. well. In addition, yeah, this, one, this one's working better. You, you might have to uh, RM mode and ins mode the driver. Maybe we can even invent a new driver hook to tell it all oh, that has configured and tear down all your DMAs. I don't know, we can make things up, but you want to be to something that you can at least, or at least set up for the next boot in a reasonable way. Do we need to use this to have dynamic groups that maybe the, dev the devices in a group disappear and reappear with the properties you provide via Sisyphus or something like that. Because I agree this is going to be like a horrendous command line and it doesn't match well that we have, we're specifying devices when we're really setting, trying to describe groups of devices. So this is turning into both territory, I reckon. Uh, not really, um, because we're opening a lot of kind of worms that we, we've had in, a, in, a, in a, you know, one of them is, uh, we have no good way to tell drivers that some horrendous stuff is happening on the PCI. Please stop what you're doing and get ready to reinitialize yourself. Windows has it. You can wipe the IOMMU driver underneath the driver and put a new one in, and it recovers at runtime, right? Um, the ability to have the, to tell a device that your bus interface is being reinitialized, stop what you're doing. Uh, it's not that hard to do for drivers themselves. I mean, all network drivers have some form of reset work uh, thread to deal with error condition, thing like this. It's going to be probably the same as a suspend resume path in many, many, many cases. In fact, we could probably use that uh, as a fallback if we don't have anything else. Um, but having the ability to, especially for what hot as well, if you want to move things around because we're running out of space, right? Take the driver off the bus, shuffle the bars, and bring them back on is not necessarily something we... You're asking the graduate questions. Let me ask the kindergarten question of why, why do we need to set up the IOMMU before uh, PCI set mastery? Well, you're talking about setting it up before we load the driver. My question is, why do we need to do that if the device can't do anything? What does it help to wait for the driver? Well, the driver knows a lot more about the model that it needs. It's a user choice. Uh, more than the driver choice here. It Devices have firmware, and firmware can do something without the driver, and it can DMA somewhere. Well, it normally don't before the driver does CI set DMA mask, but uh, and let's ignore the fact that some drivers don't because of the default 32-bit mask, and that's something we should probably fix. Um, but uh, the, the, the difficulty is that this is not necessarily a driver policy. This is, in many cases, going to be a user policy. Uh, is it a ch it's often it's going to be a compromise between security and performance, for example. So you might be able to do a driver parameter as opposed to a kernel command line parameter. But, and then we have ar arranged for all of the drivers to have basically the same syntax so that GUIs and configuration tools and management tools can actually deal with it. We, we don't have good way to generally deploy driver parameters across drivers in any deployment tool that I know of. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, all those things are possible. They all have pro and cons. Okay, I think my time is up. So <laughs> thank you for your... I, s I think I, I can pull up how we use the package, package for, for the for more discussion. Yeah, yeah you can feel free to use the well the conference to to the final transformer with the people who took part in the discussion. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it seems like it's not necessarily Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean need a more discussion I think. Yeah. Mm. Well it goes on to the question. Let, let, let's let's pass around
on here. Do we think we are okay just having that temporal infinite coming something better, or are we going to create a horrible labia that we're going to have to keep forever? That's, that's I hardly know anything about PCI or the IOMLU, but so maybe what I'm asking doesn't make sense, but I'm wondering whether specifying the um, mapping type can be postponed until the VFIO device is created. No, this is not about VFIO, this is about the DMA API default mapping. So this is not about device assignment, it's about uh, whether the device has full access to the to the system or whether it is translated by the IOMMU when the device driver takes control of it, so. Once you do VFIO, you definitely want the IOMMU destination. You don't want the <laughs> 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 So, with that approach, I'm pretty much fine if it if we can make it non-PCI specific. So if we, for example, specify a PCI in front of it or something. Yeah. Or call the, yeah, or call it, IOMU.PCI.DMA or something, or, right. yeah, sure. whatever. I'd still quite like the DMA mapping to go fast enough that people don't have to care, because theoretically, you know, as we were talking about earlier, mm -hmm. on Intel, all you need to do to map something is a single 64-bit write. You don't have to have any locking or anything, theoretically. Um, and unmapping, unmapping can be lazy, and it could go fast enough that people don't care or at least it go, could go a lot faster than it does now, in theory. Yeah. And right. I would like to aspire to that rather than having the, the cheap hack of, oh, just turn it off then. Mm. Right? I'd, I'd like to keep pursuing that. Yeah. However naive it is, I'd like to keep going. Yeah, sorry. I think I'm missing some background then. Is, is the only point of this a performance play? Is yes. that the only the it only reason for this? Between performance and okay. security. So and instead of making instead of trying to make unmap faster, we're adding a weird command line option yes. to turn it off. Yes. Okay. That doesn't. Uh, well, it, it's also that <laughs> some things have traditionally been broken and drivers have been broken. So sometimes we have done identity mapping for other stupid reasons. Mm -hmm. But it's mainly that stupid reason. Okay. Yes. Sorry, Ultimately, I don't like this because we shouldn't need it. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the one, what, what, what um, was even that if that's a naive observation. I'm sorry, guys. What's the actual bottleneck? Is it, so, sorry, Lawrence, just last, <laughs> one last question. Uh, is, is the bottleneck actually the, um, the unmap, or is it just because we miss in the TLB most are of the time? Are you price? talking about fundamental hardware reasons, or are you talking about today's software? Both. 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 I mean, what? What's, what's the underlying reason for that? We do unmap sucks, or Both. hardware is Unmap will always suck, because you're actually bashing on the hardware and doing the IoT or the TLB. Flush, right? So there, there will always be an actual latency in on that. Yeah. Theoretically, on, on Intel, it's a sing single 64-bit write of the PTE. And if you do nasty tricks like having a one-on-one -on -one mapping but only populating it, so you're not having to allocate an IO virtual address, you know it because it, it's... If you do nasty tricks so it really is a 64-bit write without any locking an IOVA allocator and any, any stuff like that, you can get a little bit faster. There was some work from... Technion in Israel a few years ago on doing exactly that. And the first mapping of a, of a given physical page gets the corresponding virtual address, bus address for it, and second and subsequent mappings have to do something else or, or ref count. But, but for, the, for the common case, it's really fast to map, and it goes a lot faster. And I don't think we ever looked hard at in, ingesting that. Is it you, um, you will still have people who want the real bypass, because if anything, the IoT will be in some circumstances, again, look at nasty people like GPU to access very, very large data sets, yep. the cost of the IoT LB becomes prohibitive. Um, but it's the GPUs we particularly want to have mapping for. <laughs> it's anything yes. that's going to ask DMA a large amount of data in a short amount of time. Guys, I think yeah. that's something that we can should keep discussing in the microconference, maybe Wednesday for the BOF 1245. Yeah. So I can think it's... Thank, thank you. you. Thank can you, you put a, a list of what we want to talk about? I, I'm keen on trying to revisit having um, ConfigFS or something as an actual non-command line interface for this. I'd like just to dig a little bit more into this, if possible. Okay, thank you. Thank you.
Okay, good afternoon, everybody. So my name is Eric Coger, and uh, my topic today is about uh, hardware nested paging enablement in the in the system MMUV free uh, driver and above. Uh, so just to give some, so I have a lot of echo. No, do you have it? Okay. Okay. Uh, just a little bit of uh, background. Uh, so what we want to achieve is to be able to run a virtual system MMU v3, typically in QMU, and make it able to work with VFIO assigned devices. Um, and uh, unfortunately, the way we can achieve this uh, cannot be uh, the way implemented on Intel, because on Intel, they have a so-called caching mode. And if the QMU um, Intel IOMMU device exposes that bit, the driver on, on, uh, on the guest is imposed to send a TLB validation on MAT, and this allows uh, the uh, uh, virtualizer to, uh, to trap everything. <coughs> and uh, using that trick, it was uh, pretty easy to, to integrate with the FIO. Unfortunately, the SMMU v3 specification does not specify that trick. Uh, so in uh, 2017, so I tried to introduce uh, by a hack a fake uh, caching mode, and uh, unfortunately, uh, so unfortunately, uh, so it was uh, rejected by Will at that point. <laughs> but I understand why. Yeah, so uh, it was not uh, uh, exposed by the specification. So the natural way to do the VFIO integration uh, was to use uh, hardware nested uh, paging, uh, which is uh, specified in the in the architecture. And uh, so the first RFC was sent in August uh, 2018. Uh, from that very beginning, uh, we had some dependencies with the SVA Intel series. Uh, we were using some common APIs, so typically the fault reporting API, uh, which is now upstream, but also the cache invalidate API. And at the beginning also, we, had, uh, uh, we were using the same uh, API to pass uh, the passive table. So this is a bit of history. Uh, now, if we look at the state today, so we have a, a V9 available, so which was sent in August uh, uh, this year. Uh, now I have split into two parts, so the IOMMU part and uh, the VFIO part. Uh, this is working on a real hardware because uh, so it was tested on Solaris uh, V2. And it was also tested by Minaro uh, with some crypto devices. Uh, we have a QMU integration that is ready and waiting for the kernel to, to show up. And uh, so now, uh, if we enter into uh, the detail of uh, both series, so first the IUMMU part, um, just uh, to explain, we have two different flavors uh, of APIs to pass the guest uh, passive entry information on ARM and on Intel. So on ARM, we are able to, uh, uh, to pass directly the pointer to the passive table. But on uh, Intel, this is not possible because uh, uh, in the passive entry, you find the information for both the stage one tables and the stage two tables. Or in the Intel's uh, vocable, this is uh, the level, the first one uh, level the first level and the second level. Uh, so this explains why we currently have two different APIs uh, to, bind, uh, to, 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 to bind the guest uh, configuration. Uh, on ARM, we have also uh, something that is very specific to the MSI handling because the ARM SMMU v3 uh, and uh, SMMU in general uh, translate uh, the MSIs where on Intel they are bypassed. Uh, so the guest uh, needs to provide its stage one binding of MSIs so that uh, the virtualizer uh, can, can build a nested binding. So stage one plus stage two that uh, eventually reaches the physical doorbell. Uh, so this means that uh, I was forced to introduce a spe special MSI cookie. Okay, so it's, uh, it's uh, the complex part, I would say, of the series. And uh, on the SMMU v3 side, uh, so in the driver, so it was a matter of uh, enabling new <coughs> transition of states from stage one to stage one plus stage two and uh, conversely. 
And obviously, so we needed to implement the, the UMMU uh, user API we saw just before. So it's quite invasive in the SMMU v3 driver, but it's not that much complex, I would say, uh, besides maybe the MSI handling, which is a, a little bit uh, more tricky to, to understand. On the FIO side, so for me, it's, it's, it's more trivial. So we just bind to the UMMU user API we introduced in the in the uh, previous series. And now bulk of the series is related to the fault reporting handling because we introduced uh, a new uh, region in the VFIO uh, device and also uh, that, that allows to, uh, to share, uh, to expose to the user space the faults. And we have a ring of, of uh, faults that is unmappable from the user space. Um, and uh, to, to prepare for the, uh, for the introduction of uh, recoverable errors, uh, so now we have a versioning mechanism uh, which is uh, proposed directly by the VFIO API. So uh, in the capabilities for the, the introduced region, we can update this and later on we can support uh, uh, recoverable uh, uh, errors. So now I come to the actual uh, discussion. So first of all, I would like to understand from you uh, if there is any conceptual blocker, I mean, with this approach. I know it, so it's complex, it's invasive. Uh, from a performance size, so it, it can be argued. Uh, besides, we have, have no real uh, uh, benchmarks to provide at the moment. We have another uh, Virtaio IOMMU solution, which can be seen as comp competitor. Uh, for some use cases. Uh, and besides that, so it's something that's specified in the ARM uh, SMMU specification. And uh, so I think it was worth to, to enable it. So this is the first question. So do you maintainers see any blocker in uh, enabling the hardware nested paging? Okay. And uh, in the... Uh, uh, um, um, SMU v3 uh, definition, the context, con the context, context decryption you, uh, contains VMID in your, in, in your context decryption. Yeah. That means UTLB entries is use the VMID and ACID as the namespace changing. And that, that is different from the Intel. Intel directly used the PASID. Yes, is that right? Intel directly used the PASID as the TLB entries namespacing, not, not the window of it. <coughs> I, I mean, yeah. I mean you IOMU TLB is tagged, entry is, is tagged uh, by is the PASID? Yeah, yeah, use the PASID oh. as the, as the yeah, yes. address. Yeah, yes. that's different from the ARMS right, one. Right, ARM used the VMID and not used PASID. And the PASID, uh, uh, the how to think about this, this, this difference? Why, why ARM use another VMID not directly use PASID? Right. So actually, in my case, I, I do not uh, focus much on the, the PASID use case because I have a single PASID uh, up to now. Uh, I have a, si a single uh, context in my uh, in my uh, in my passive table. Um, so I think that there are uh, we we have uh, discrepancies in the way we tag uh, the caches, the TLBs on ARM and, and uh, Intel. But uh, so I cannot. Uh, uh, what was uh, f f uh, the passive is twenty bits? Yeah. And the uh, VMID, what's the ARM VMID with is maybe not a, not a 20 bits. 16. Six, 14? 16. Oh, 16, okay. So why not uh, directly use the passive IDs for this design? I want to design. That's, that's not directly what the TLB does, right? So question, actually. Uh, I, you're talking about the hardware uh, architecture that is designed to support translation at both the supervisor and the guest level, right? Mm -hmm. So how come is your TLB can not tag with both? Yeah. Okay. So ACID, ACID. yeah, okay. So you have ACID and PASID or not? Well, plus, yeah. Yeah. PASID is same as one, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, so the ACID is the, and this is nomenclature, and I don't think it's worthwhile us talking about too long, but the ACID is the ID for the first stage of translation, so then that would be potentially mm -hmm. have a passive involved as well, and then VMID is the, the stage two context, which is your... Okay, yeah, okay but the TLV yeah. stack with both. Yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah, yeah okay, okay. Well, I, 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 I know, I, well, is all that was not a thought, so but so from the con conversation here, I was under the impression that that wasn't the case. Yeah. So, yeah. so actually, it does not uh, uh, answer to my... Uh, my original question, I think the question was for, for Will directly. Uh, right, yeah, so I mean, um, in terms of conceptual blockers, I think I've got a few questions and concerns and we can probably follow them up between the two of us. Um, one thing I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that you're adding a whole load of uh, passive support for dealing with the emulation, whereas actually Linux running native in the guest doesn't use PACIDs for anything. For the timing, yes. yes. Right, so I think that I'd rather do it the other way around. And I, I know that is a bit of a problem for you. I'd rather we had Linux using passes natively, or at least knowing how to do it, and then we had your code. Otherwise, we have a whole lot of code that we can't yeah, test. So we had and second, second, there's no hub. <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't talk at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Another question? Okay. Well, anyway, um, we continue this question now. Uh, I start another question. I haven't finished yet. I can just okay, finish okay. my point. Okay, um, I, I ask another question about. Okay. It. So I think yeah. Will has not completed. So if you if you okay. accept, uh, Will, can you complete? Uh, yeah, sure. So the only other thing is I, I have um I have. Oh, oh God. <laughs> <laughs> Matter and antimatter. <laughs> yeah. So the other thing is that I. I I mean, there's very little in the way of general purpose passive capable hardware that I'm aware of. So I certainly have no way of testing any of this. I don't know if you have a way of testing it. I'd, I'd like someone who can regularly test this so we don't see regressions because okay. we're at a point now where on, on ARM uh, 64 parts, they tend to ship with an SME v3 in the server space. People are using it. And if you get that code wrong, it's disastrous. You know, they lose data and things like that. Mm. So I'm just nervous about writing quite a lot of complex code and introducing complex code to the driver, which we're unable to, to test. Yeah, so on my side, I, as I stated, so I tested on two different machines, so I'm aware that you, you may not have, have access to the same kind of machines, but uh, so I hope nowadays we can see uh, SMMU v3 implementation with two stages with the right uh, implementation for the TLBs and so on. But, but, but are you using PRI? So, sorry? Are you using PRI? No, I don't. For exactly. Right? Okay, but, uh, <laughs> but that's a problem also. If I wait for this uh, kind of hardware to be available, mm -hmm. uh, so I can wait forever. So well, does that depend on? No, I'm not going to repeat what you just said, right? We, ha we, we can't test. So why not maybe either do what you said, which might take a while before we even have it, or maybe look at a simpler version. We <coughs> do not support multiple passes. We still allow nesting with a single but passage. So, so that's actually what I try to achieve. Okay. I try to remove this dependency on PRY and so on. And uh, so we had this discussion with Jean-Philippe and I think uh, uh, waiting for, for more and more features. So uh, we are just blocked because we cannot test. But uh, uh, with the current series uh, can be tested uh, with actual hardware today. So as we long as you don't create a passive table with more than one entry. Uh, yes, yes. But uh, in any case, the emulation code does not support more than, okay. uh, than one facet uh, at the moment. I could develop that, but... Uh, I mean, you could, can you nobble the feature and just not support it in the, ex in the, the emulated SMMU? Yes, I can. I, I, I would prefer something just for baby steps, and then that's then a simpler thing to reason about. It's completely independent from the SVM work. Modulo structure repainting, which mm. is fine. I don't care which tree that comes via. And then we can always try to enable it later on when we've got something that we understand what the bloody hell it does. Because <laughs> I just that's one of the reasons that I mm. have not been paying too much attention to this is that I, I don't see um, I don't see people using it. Uh, yeah, sure, sure. But uh, it's a chicken and egg issue. Uh, <laughs> it if, is. if there's no Linux integration, so mm -hmm. no people will devise hardware for that. Yeah. Uh, so just for the others, so this is an hardware implementation choice to implement both stages. Mm -hmm. And also you have to devise the right topology for the TLBs, otherwise uh, it may not work properly. So, so how, how do you, because we have Vert.io IMMU and I think that's merged now. 
Yes, but uh, um, the story is not complete uh, because uh, so it's uh, the driver is there, but uh, the way to integrate it uh, with the firmware is not uh, is not ready because we don't, do not know if we should uh, use the IORT for the CPI. Uh, and um, so now Michael Turkin is pushing for a quirk on PCI uh, to, to build the bindings uh, without the IORT table, so, but uh, I don't figure out how this is feasible. Mm -hmm. So yes, the driver is available, but uh, it, it cannot be used at the moment. So Whereas uh, I think this solution can be used now that's not a good reason for having two drivers, though, or two devices, even. I, th I think what probably needs to be done is a document, or even not nothing big, a text file, it needs to be written to say, hey, what you're doing this, you should use this IMME. Oh, you're doing this, then you should use <coughs> the nested one. Because okay, if, right. we, if we just have two emulated devices and neither of them quite do what, yeah. know, they, they don't cover the but whole uh, space. Yeah, then yeah. It's I a understand bit what you mean. So I can write such kind of uh, documentation. Uh, on the other hand, so that's funny because uh, we, we don't have any uh, performance figures for either the Virtio IO MMU nor, nor this solution. So, but the Virtio IO MMU is uh, it's a lot more portable than this. This is very much yes, tied to a I specific agree. piece of hardware, and I think it's a lot of effort to invest in one particular piece of architecture, one particular driver, one particular piece of hardware, with a, a sort of an unclear use case and unclear benefit. Whereas the Virtio IMU, at, at the very least, yeah. you get a specification out of it. What we know for sure is Virtio IMU, if you have dynamic mappings, uh, you, you will have uh, difficulties to sustain the performance. Whereas with this solution, it should be transparent, I mean. <coughs> yeah. So relying only on the Virtio IMU looks, uh, so for DPD typically, we, I agree, so it will work perfectly. But for uh, nested or uh, so we will, we will face exactly the same issue as we have on x86. So that's why I, I try to push the, the both solutions. I am also working on the Virtio IUMMU, you know, so it's okay. Do we know of a reasonably available PCI device that implements uh, PASI, PRI, PRI, and all that gunk, other than NVIDIA uh, or AMD GPUs? Because you don't want to touch those drivers. Uh, hmm? I think the Anaconda's chip could do it. Who? Sorry? I think the Anaconda's chip could do it. Not really available. <laughs> um, but because of that class of device where you're basically. Because uh, mm. we, we had the whole shipment going on par with the NVIDIA NVLink, mm. but none of that is either public or readily available or. If we have a non too expensive PCI based <laughs> FPGA, we could just put together something that people can use. Yeah, if you've got something that can be abused as a general purpose PCI target device and you can essentially craft your own packets and do your own crap, which a lot of these things are in software ultimately, then yes, you can go and make yourself a device with duct tape duct tape and string that implements PRI and or passive support and you can have what, something what's that the state of the latest design where PCI endpoint stuff it can do all of the generate all the PRI message and all that crap because then you pick up any of those things uh, you know 70 bucks little arm 64 thingy that has PCI and you flip it into a device mode and we and we can create a test platform and some of them are more generic than others and give you more ability to craft your own packets. But yeah, I'm fairly sure that some of those will be able to do this. Uh, so, so we have endpoint support, but I'm not sure if, if we could modify something like a PRI or, or, or any other IDs uh, that, that, that goes along with the PCI packet. Uh, at the max, I think maybe you can try to change the requester ID. Okay, so we could also, like, let's try to see if any of us yeah. find something. If you don't mind, so let, let's come back to the, the original. Uh, so, the, so, okay. so there is a new controller, Cadence uh, PCI controller, which also supports endpoint mode. 
Uh, again, in that also, I'm not sure if you could modify the the pass ID or, or things like that, but I can check. Okay. Um, so th then, uh, Will, uh, your answer is, is, is not fully clear for me. So shall I continue working on this, or shall I stop somehow? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, so we can talk about that uh, later. Uh, then, uh, for you maintainers, uh, also the question is: uh, so I know you you had some pain to follow the user API we introduced on the IOM menu side, uh, which uh, were shared uh, with uh, uh, PAM series on, uh, on SVA uh, uh, for Intel also. Um, so just to, to help you uh, follow all those changes, so what can uh, be done to ease your review, uh, maybe uh, stand a separate uh, series just with the user API. Uh, so I think now we can, you can have a, an, over, an overall understanding of uh, what it, it is uh, used for. Uh, so my next target uh, for, for this series to, to land upstream, if it, uh, if it happens, uh, is to get the user API accepted. And I, I think uh, we share the, the same understanding uh, on Intel side. And uh, also it would allow you to, to review the right, uh, the right series. So what do, what do you prefer? Uh, sh shall we send a separate series for just containing the user API? Or uh, can you follow uh, the respective series uh, either on Intel side or on ARM side? So it's up to you. So Practical question. May I ask another question? Okay. Uh, yes, uh, can, can I get the answer and then we, we jump to you? Okay. Okay. Ha. Huh. And. Uh, <laughs> oh, no. Okay. I, I really love that. Um, yeah, so I would prefer a, a separate posting of only the API changes because that's what I okay. review usually. Okay. And if it's self contained, then, then it's easier for me and I can skim through it much quicker. So. Okay. I know for the for the reporting API, John managed a uh, public, I mean, shared repo. Is that something you prefer? I mean, I, I and Eric can, can work together, put the, the shared UAPI there, and then uh, submit patches of that repo. Is that? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll talk a little bit about the next uh, session. Okay, so your question now. Uh, okay, uh, my question is, uh, that, that's obviously, uh, I see uh, the ARM, uh, ARM architecture put the VMID in the stream table, and mm -hmm. that's different from the Intel's do it. They put it in the passive table. Yeah, that means Intel's passive table, the stage two could be uh, could uh, could uh, could be support some virtual function this kind of thing, and uh, and uh, and uh, the limit of ARM design is is ta is 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 must bind a uh, physical function uh, to one must bind what bind the uh, physical function f physical function function by the PCI physical function to uh, to one virtual machine, yeah? But the Intel could uh, bind the several... Yeah, this is the endeavor. Yeah, scale mode, uh, scale scale mode yeah, yeah. How do we think about it? Do, mm, do you think uh, ARM's architecture should be modified to support this kind I of? I think this is beyond uh, the scope of... Uh, I don't think it's relevant to what uh, Eric is asking the audience. Maybe... Yeah, so I mean, we'll discuss with architects at, at ARM, and yeah. but, uh, I'm not the right person to, <laughs> to okay, okay. discuss with them. Uh, I don't okay. know, I think I, I rather, uh, well, Eric, I don't know if you have any further questions for the yeah, audience. Yeah, I'm sorry, but uh, so maybe you can discuss yeah. uh, with armed people and uh, you, you okay. will get more interesting uh, feedback. I, 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 just, I just means, uh, I, just, I just look at uh, third part to, to see, and uh, I think maybe scale mode uh, is, is a little bit more flexible. Yeah, I think yeah, that's yeah, not, I think uh, uh, but the point yeah. is that we're not discussing that now. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. Okay, yeah. So I don't know if you want to wrap it up, Eric, do you have any further questions? Yes, that? actually the last point was about the MSI binding, uh, which I, I think this is the most difficult part in, uh, 
in the ZIU MMU series. Uh, but uh, well, so let's let's put uh, the first steps uh, first. Uh, this documentation you are requesting, uh, Will, uh, about and then we will discuss about uh, technical uh, details. And uh, about the VMID and is uh, another question is, uh, do you plan to have a window technolo technology for them? I, I mean, uh, I mean, in past, their, their usages currently don't have any window technology, means just like the acid used by CPUs and uh, roll over with the version. And, uh, I, and do you have a plan? Because, uh, because, uh, because ARM use 16, Bit uh, as uh, as with with to acid, the design acid and the VMID. So, do you have do you want to pl do a uh, window technology to for for the VMID acid for your for ARM's IOMMU designer mm -hmm. to support the more more wide. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> again, uh, I'm not a, uh, an hardware uh, guy. So I think we answered the question. We are not discussing uh, that now. So I think we should move to over to Jakub and answer your questions offline later when it's relevant to the topic we are handling. Thank you. So thank you for your attention. Hello, uh, my name is Jacob Penn. I work for Intel. It used to be called an open source technology center, but now it's something more obscure. And, uh, but anyway, <laughs> uh, anyway, while your uh, memory or cache is still uh, warm about PASIT, I'm going to talk more about PASIT. And this topic was uh, uh, initially proposed by my colleague. He, uh, he couldn't come here, so I try to cover uh, you know, the, the whole whole topic and uh, hopefully what I, uh, what I said is uh, correct. If it's wrong, you can forward it to him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, I want to talk about uh, the passive basically life, life cycle management and uh, basically uh, in a bigger context of shared virtual addressing or shared virtual memory. And uh, I'm going to uh, use IO ACID or ACID uh, kind of interchangeably in this case, because uh, in, the, in the upstream proposed patches, uh, we were agreed that uh, we're going to use IOAC, which is more uh, neutral. Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, the allocation the free. And uh, if I have time, we can talk about the, uh, uh, the mapping between uh, identity uh, guest host passive versus non-identity being uh, guest has its own passive space versus uh, you know, host has uh, always used the host passive. And then the uh, typical uh, life cycle, the second step is uh, allocation and then bind uh, to a MM, uh, either uh, can be guest or host process. And then more importantly, it's the, the, uh, the, the teardown part or the, or the exception cases that has a lot of uh, risk conditions I wanted to touch upon and have uh, quite a, a maybe three opens uh, hopefully to get some answers. Um, 
So those are exception cases for uh, you know process termination uh, or gas crash, and uh, because it's a silent device, sometimes device you know devices have direct control to the. I mean, driver in the gas has direct control to the device, so they can issue uh, work uh, dispatch work and uh, do work submission. Also, can abort passive, and those may be a little bit uh, sometimes out of sync with the uh, um, the software side of handling, for example, uh, page request service uh, that's going on between the IOM and the U and uh, and the U and uh, the user space in the gas. Uh, before I, I can kind of jump into the, the technical part, uh, this is uh, kind of a uh, continuation of what uh, Eric was asking uh, uh, in terms of upstream plan. Can we make it, uh, you know, upstream uh, in a very uh, kind of coordinate and also a reviewable fashion? So what uh, we have uh, in mind was to divide into baby steps, make something really simple first. Uh, and then get those merged and then move on uh, to, to solve uh, you know, more complex problems. So roughly we, our plan is to submit in uh, three phases. Currently we're on just supporting a PCI device assignment. Uh, uh, so uh, it will be nested translation, uh, you know, basically guest uh, shared virtual memory uh, without handling page request. So this is uh, the latest patch posted here in, uh, uh, last month. So for that, we only need uh, basically three, C, three APIs, IOMMU APIs, and a corresponding VFIO uh, uh, IOCTO, I mean, uh, APIs that's in uh, Eric's uh, series. So uh, we need to, unlike, you know, as Eric mentioned, we don't have, we have per passive granularity to assign to individual guests this way. And then the guest passive table is owned by the host, and then and we only have bind gas passive per passive basis. So we introduced API to bind gas passive. And, uh, and if the caching validation uh, part is shared between uh, uh, ARM and uh, Intel. And you mean the the uh, including the, uh, the, yeah, the gas passive cache. Well, sorry, the, for, the, for the recordings. Uh, when you caching rate, I, mean, I haven't followed the patches. Which specific caches are you talking about? Uh, this IOTLB device TLB uh, okay, invalidation. The pass ca passive cache uh, invalidation uh, does not use the, this API. It basically results in a in a bind against passive. Okay. So w I'm coming here from a, from a different world. So there are some details I don't I'm not familiar with. You're saying that in some conditions we have to share the passive space between guests and hosts that do not have completely uh, orthogonal passive space. Yeah. So the, the simply case, we, uh, we, we pass the space is system-wide. So no matter how many guests you have, you always draw passive allocation from the host, which share the 20 so That's because bit. your IOTLB is not tagged by some form of VMID. It's only tagged by passive? No. OK. Well, no, yeah, that's just relatively uh, simple. We, you know, we don't have to do the guest host passive translation. Because one of the features we have is called the NQ command. Uh, the guest application can directly submit work uh, without going through the driver. And uh, if you do the guest pass it uh, itself, uh, we, we have to do a guest host pass it translation. But, you on, but because in hardware you have a single pass it space that you share between host and guest. Yeah. The While, if I'm, if I'm correctly, Mark is saying about ARM, your TLB is tagged by VMID and passive, meaning that you have a full passive space for every guest. So we do not have to do any ghost, guest host translation, right? Because in power is the same. In PowerPC, uh, back when I was at IBM, um, we tagged both. And so uh, each guest would have a complete passive space. I'm trying to understand what the limit is. So I'm, I'm on the edge of my knowledge here as well. But the problem, as I understand it, is you have the main TLBs of the IOMU. Mm -hmm. which may be for us, say, SIDB mid, for Intel, probably something else, I don't know. And then you have the ATCs, which are the IOTLBs in the PCIe endpoint, mm -hmm. right? And that part is PCI spec, mm -hmm. and the things in there, I suspect, are only passive tags. Like the VFIs. Well, yes, but, but they're not going uh, they're not gonna have knowledge of... of right, so that will fill from the main IMMU TLB, but the tag is going to be different, is the way I understand it. This is only a problem if you want a single BDF pen 
to support passage from different partitions of both hosts and guests? Or because usually the BDFN maps some address space or VM ID. Uh, at least that's how I understand things, but my understanding of Intel is not that good. So. Well, I think it's actually, each BDF will have its own passage space, right? Yeah. I, I don't see Yeah, it's the passage table is per BDF. So why do you need to share this with each other? I'm trying well, to understand. Just, uh, from upstream perspective, is the, the simplicity for right now, because uh, this way. But that means that every time a guest wants to pop a passage, he has to talk to the hypervisor, which makes things a lot comp more complicated. Every time, sorry, I didn't get yeah, it. Uh, every time the, whole, the guest wants to allocate a new passage, it needs yeah. to coordinate with the hypervisor, yeah. which sounds complicated. You shouldn't need to do that. Yeah. If you it's have a... Not, uh, in our spec, we have the implemented, uh, emulate, uh, emulated kind of, uh, kind of uh, interface for passage allocation in the spec, kind of like the caching mode. Ah, okay, let's, uh, let's move on. Yeah. Uh, I, I need to sorry. understand more about what your hardware is actually doing here. Okay, so, so so uh, I really want to get out of this slide is, can we agree on this, uh, uh, well, this baby that step? Does go back to that. I think agreeing on that does go back to understanding that question. Why do we need an interface to communicate with the hypervisor and coordinate on passives? Why would we need to do that? Is something we need it's to discuss before we agree to do it, right? It's in the spec. It's a, uh, hard I, I, yeah. I'm perfectly <laughs> prepared to declare that <laughs> so Intel specs are frankly insane at times and maybe we don't want to do it that way. Um, what, what is the actual hardware restriction that means we have to do this? There's no hardware restriction. Even with the, uh, even with the, the emulated passive, you know, the kind of uh, uh, gas only uh, passive allocation, we, we call a virtual command interface, it can still be intercepted by the uh, hypervisor and provide either identity or non-identity mapping. So, yeah. Yeah, so, so we are yeah, totally so free within Linux to declare we're going to do identity mapping because anything else is pointless and not have to do any of this stuff of individual okay. passives, right? Mm. Yeah. Okay. But that's just a special case, basically, you say, right? Uh, rewind. I have two devices. One is in guest A, the other one is in guest B. They both use passive one. Where is the problem? Why do I need to turn those two passive ones into some other passive? Why can't the hardware, is uh, IOTLB not tagging the BDFN along with the, the passive or what? The both use passive, but when the, say, page requests come in, they're gonna... The BDFN the should BDF differentiate. And the passive, it comes with BDF and passive. Yes. So if that's just passive one, but it's a different passive one. It's a passive one of that BDFN and a passive one of that BCFN, and they go to different guests. That's the, the combination of the BDFN yeah, and passive then matches. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's combination. Yeah, yeah. But we also allow BDF passive, I mean, within, within one BDF, multiple pass, multiple subdivides and being assigned to separate okay. guests. Okay. Right. So separate no, guests. No, okay. that, is my, that is the answer I was looking for. So you're yeah. allowing within a same device, uh, yeah. uh, same, let's say, originator ID to be less PCI specific. You yeah. allow several, the multiple passes to be targeted at different yeah. VM contexts. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Is, it, is, it, is it to support scalable IOV that you are doing this? Yeah, yeah, that's, ah, okay. that's exactly for. Yeah. yeah. So I think for scalable IOV. Ooh, I don't know what scalable yeah, IOV is. Yeah, scalable IOV is the only mode in uh, Intel will support passes. Yeah. yeah. In which you actually share a same BDF function, uh, you know, with multiple contexts. Okay. So that yeah. means that the BDF will remain the same, and you will need to have a pool of passives from which you. So it's basically for lazy people who don't want to implement a SRIOV. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or who no, hit other limits with their SRIOV. But okay. I guess that's that's a viable justification for wanting. Sure, no, absolutely. But I, I, I wanted to clarify it. I, I think it's. Okay. Some of us, at least myself, were mi missing that background. Yeah, Volus yeah, yeah. uh, scalable IOV patches already Let's not worked. figure out why, because we had a SRV, but okay, yeah. whatever. Or it's just a lightweight. Yeah. It's not lightweight for software, we have to deal with it, but. <laughs> so I, I also have a question. So um, when the guest has one of these mediated devices, does it have an emulated IOMMU? Yeah, 
Yeah. So yeah. it's so it's. But there's the case. Intel I mean, you basically itself. Yeah, see, it's the Intel IMU, mean, but only sees PCI device, the the media device yeah, okay. presented as. Yeah. And the given device. I assign. Yeah, and that and in, and with that I mean, you it has also pe uh, PSID support or. Yeah. That it, it okay. has to be. Yeah. So. So then probably the best is to have a non-identity guest host PSID mapping and just. But then you can't yeah. do that sharing thing that they were talking about. Which sharing thing? Other than of having the same. Yes, given my name is Hashim, so I'm assuming he knows that. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. But <coughs> you can tell the guest basically you have, say, 16 PES IDs, and the physical device has 32, and then you can partition your host PES ID space among the guest PES ID spaces. So yeah, we've thought about that. That's complicated too. <laughs> so you also yeah. end up with but an interesting Yeah, you need to keep track in the host which mm. guest PSID maps to which host PSID right. and do the translation all the time. And yeah. how do you reasonably uh, make well, uh, the decision of out of your limited passage space who gets how much? Right, that's a that's another yeah, yeah. concern. Yeah. So uh, we can touch that. Uh, I have four, only four slides, but I, I think for our ba first baby step we don't need to concerned too much, or just PCI device assignment. And uh, can we agree on, I mean, the things, those API can get merged first, uh, and then we can move on. The, the, the I, don't, I don't think the breakdown is controversial. Uh, I don't know. Uh, anybody disagree? The breakdown seems perfectly reasonable. Um, I, I, I would have to just look at the patches. I mean, I'm interested in how you define the amounts that get allocated for every uh, uh, context of virtual device, for example, that sort of stuff. So those are the little nastiest things that you don't think about initially and then come and bite you <laughs> badly later on. I mean, what value is assigned to each of those functions? Well, it depends what you define by performance. Uh, if the user just can't do what he wants to do because he's running out of space, it becomes a functionality problem. Online oh, no, performance is a different question. Can yeah. you pass on that to Well, so. Yeah, so you, you talked about a request, so that means you have an API. Uh, you're not just emulating a piece of hardware. That gets a bit more complex. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, so the, the, so next the, the question I still yeah. have is, why do you need a separate guest PSID uh, interface to bind, bind guest PSID when, when we have bind PSID? Can we make the bind PSID interface suitable for both, for host and for guest PSID bind. bindings? Uh, Good point. No, it's a different because the, get, the host bind you have the, uh, for example, the MM notifier. I mean, but, but the, the guest bind just doesn't have it. It binds the guest CR3. So the, the when the, you know, the guest process terminates, the it, the it has to result in the unbind and eventually pass that. So it's it's very different than the, the native bind. And but we do. In terms of tracking, uh, it's different in what it does, but should it does it need to be different in terms of interface? That I think more. You'll correct me if I'm wrong, but that's more the question, right? Should the API be different? I mean, we we, we could imagine nested virtualization when we're going to have a, a guest well binding the, a sub guest. And the difference between the the host handling, uh, between the handling of a PESA default on the host and in and which one which has a full bottle in the guest is. The handling of faults, right? The, mm -hmm. the, the, the actual fault function that is running in the end. Yeah. So we can have a base interface, which is more like this, which doesn't have an MM as a parameter, but mm -hmm. more like a fault handler uh, descriptor or something. Mm -hmm. And then build on the top of that the host and the guest support. The, the fault handling, uh, if that's a native case, is usually just handled within the IOMU, host IOMU driver itself. Where gas bind, you need to inject through VFIO, right? So we already have uh, the, the IOMU device fault reporting API, so that, that's common. I mean, but that. Let's look at the patches, I don't know. It's hard to, we're yeah. getting into details that's hard to decide anything when we start actually seeing the code. What exactly is calling the APIs on the left-hand pane there? Are those visible to Mostly Arbitrary via PCI via device drivers? Uh, VFIO? No, those are a guess by the VFIO, yeah. Okay. It's uh, through, we say, Eric's uh, 
Yeah, and those, those cache invalidate is really the, the guess uh, passed down cache invalidate. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the IO, IO exit allocation, those are shared between the guest and the host, but there will be a kind of a switch to decide whether you are in the guest or not. So you use a separate allocation. So with the with a single interface where you just register uh, some kind of fault handling mechanism mm -hmm. for a given pass ID, you, uh, BFIO, for example, could just register its own fault handling mechanism for a pass yeah. ID if it wants to pass through that pass ID to the guest. Yeah. And we, we any and then we have a separate um, piece of code which does that for host processes, which is then called by device driver that. Yeah. Use the yeah. The device. yeah, VFIO is just one of the device driver can be treated that way. And, and uh, yeah, I have one of the open to, to, to talk about the w some of the, the gaps in terms of uh, fault, fault reporting. I mean, maybe we can talk so about it if that's the that, that means effectively that on the host side, the, you say the implementation is directly done in the IMMU driver for the host side fault handler, right? Mm -hmm. That's what you were saying before. Sorry, yeah, the, the, the host detects the, the fault. And but the implementation of the fault handler itself is in the host IO memory driver or is elsewhere? Um, yes, the IO memory driver implements the first, but it, it, the, say there's our recover fault and the recover fault. So it will make a determination whether you want, uh, you want to give a driver a chance to do something about the fault. Uh, like, like I think the previous discussion you had. So, and then can tell, uh, you know, the driver did something, say uh, reset, uh, whatever. Give it a chance that it's being handled, kind of like the IRQ handled or, you know, continue case. And, and also for guest uh, fault, uh, there'll be a flag, say this guest pass it belong to the guest. So you don't do anything, you give it to the, the guest and the guest will handle MM fault and then eventually come back, uh, give you a paid response. So, um, I guess it's similar <laughs> than the SVA, native SVA bind. Uh, I can look into it, uh, whether we can consolidate. Um, yeah, but maybe the interface will get a little bit more, you know, the structure gets a little more uh, complicated. Yeah. Yeah, definitely I can look into that, yeah. Yeah, okay. That was something I was al also wondering about when looking at the patches, so. Okay, so maybe this, uh, at least a flag or something to, to indicate yeah. Okay, but in terms of fault reporting, that should be able to share. Yeah, because right now we have per device uh, IOM may detect for a fault device fault handler. Yeah. So in the case where we do not have the sharing of uh, passive space, it would be nice if the exact same interface could be used. And so effectively, that means that bind GPC is either a knob or just whatever housekeeping that may need to be done in hardware for flushing the passive cache or something. Um, so I don't know, I've, I haven't looked, but uh, it will be still nice to have the same interface for registering passes, regardless of the type of uh, memory we have under the hood. I see. So instead of just a dead API for ARM, for example, you, you want... So if you don't share, or on Intel and you are not in shared mode, and you have separate passive spaces, do you want to we be allocated? Hmm? We don't have that anymore. We oh, it's okay. So Intel yeah. went all the way to removing the ability to... Right, because there wasn't user anyway. Well, yeah. yeah. There's also other reasons why people don't use ATS. And the um, tables had to be contiguous, and it was just horrible. Okay. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Um, Is this the wrong time to ask? How do you cope with first level versus second level faults when you're passing through passives? And do you pre fault the actual target page when the guest has faulted in that? I suppose it all just came in. Yeah, for the first phase, yeah, we to require the guest pre fault page. And the second level is pinned down. So, um, it's remaining t time. Uh, I want to kind of touch on the... The, the, the second the level you said is pinned down. Uh, I yeah. hope that's not our long-term... No. Mm. So, so um, this picture we try to show, we have uh, basically two, uh, two flows, the, soft the slow pass and the, and the fast pass for the, for the pass it's uh, set up. Uh, and and the, the run runtime DMA. So the slow pass, uh, we have you know the big bang time pass it and the pass it cache, the validation and eventually go to you know pass it programming, and on the fast pass we handle the DMA and the page request. The point I try to make is that we, we because the 
the interaction for page request uh, is between uh, you know the guest uh, process guest kernel and and then and the IOMMU where device can also directly control sub work submission with the passive. So we have this uh, race condition, especially when when we need to tear down. Uh, so so I think uh, Alex, uh, when we reviewed the patch, also mentioned that and and that when we unregister the uh, so those are the kind of the issue I want to bring up um, because we can do per pass it uh, and a BDF assignment to a guest and uh, when, when we are with, with lack of uh, kind of a function level reset on a per pass it basis but it's also important then to keep the passive life cycle separate meaning when you terminate the passive for whatever reason you don't want it to you know anything remain we need to drain everything in the software in the hardware so uh, I, I want to propose a adding a new API to to do the passive stop, which does the pass, passive drain, and also uh, clear all the pending faults. Uh, you mean the driver API? Yeah, the IOMMU API. Sorry, okay, I didn't follow. So give uh, so so basically the use case would be say for example today if we device want to do a issue a uh, command, say well, I want to abort this passive and it goes to the device, and the device will not be able to abort if there are pending faults. But there's no way to, but the pending faults are basically responded by the IOMMU driver. So there's lack of uh, communication there. But if we have this, this API to stop the passing and the drain everything, and when the time to unbind and to, to abort, they will be always succeed. So the unregistration of the handler will also always succeed. We don't have to deal with it. You, what you need, you need, yes, you, you need a, s the, the, sorry. Yeah, I mean, you need the hardware to support the passive reset and draining of all the uh, transactions in flight. And do you have With to that them to test it as well? No, I don't th think that is. I think the, by, sp by spec, the hardware uh, is, uh, has to wait for the all the pending page requests to be responded. Otherwise, the, the device will not but abort. It, it's not just that. I mean, do we, we, do, do we have a way that is standard? to tell a piece of hardware to today, stop using that passive. Like regardless, assuming it finishes all its pending requests, and I don't think we do. Yeah. So <coughs> no. Yeah, so. I mean, it's the equivalent of FLR, and it, I don't think it is currently available at the passive granularity. I've, I've right, that's the, the, the point, yeah. So fundamentally, what you need, because you have a guest who stops using a passive. The host uh, must not re freeze the underlying real passive uh, until it has a reasonable trusted agent telling it that piece of hardware is no longer using it. Mm -hmm. um, that agent has to be in the hypervisor. So, but I assume that if you have a device that can be shared with multiple guests, there must be some form of coordinating driver in the hypervisor because otherwise I don't know how you can do that. It's a bit like the PF if you have a FSR IOV, right? Well, if you, the, the device misbehave and it's still doing transaction with the old pass, it will get auto-responded. Uh, Until it gets allocated to somebody else and then you have right. a real problem right. on your hands. there's no way to, I don't No, know but so don't, that's why I'm not saying let's bother too much about a driver, a device with physically broken and I'm just saying a device that it can it's, it's not broken. It's uh, actually by spec. The device uh, abort can can be timed out or or pending if you if the IOMMU driver does not respond to all the pending faults. Yes. Yeah, so what what you're trying to fix here is a chicken and egg thingy where you try to stop the passive at the hypervisor level, but you can't because the device on behalf of the guest is waiting on an IOMMU response. So you do need. Indeed, I see what you mean. Tell the IOMU drivers to terminate any pending request yeah. uh, for that passive. I, I understand that. Yeah. Um, I am still somewhat uh, wondering, in terms of, uh, from a security perspective, uh, how the hypervisor gets a reasonable guarantee that that device had indeed uh, stopped using the passive and doesn't have something in a guest who's going to sneak through more requests uh, after we think the passing is free and we're going to give it to somebody else. And that smells to me that there is a gap in 
spec uh, that needs to be addressed, and so uh, mm -hmm. it's an Intel spec, yeah. guys, uh, to provide uh, some standardized hardware mechanism to say do not issue anything anymore with that passive, or maybe you and that well, would so be. Isn't that the what the invalid response for? I mean, they're telling any no more requests mm -hmm. from their passive. The invalid response from the IOMMU driver, the response code, I mean. So the response, you have today a response code on the bus that tells the device no more requests for that right. passive. Yeah. But that's only useful if the device has done a request. Yeah. If the device hasn't done a request yet, I, I don't know. We, you, you know, I can run a little bit of code on the device that's going to do the request shortly after I've been killed. So it, it, it's, I don't know, it's kind of corner cases that uh, I think r deserve a big magnifier yeah. and make sure that they have been addressed. We're not going to solve it now, yeah. and I think we yeah, should move on. But I, yeah, uh, I must ask you to wrap up. I don't know if you have any further questions for the audience or you want to follow up on Wednesday if you have time, I mean. Okay, yeah, just a quick question maybe um, uh, for, uh, for Alex. Uh, if we implement this kind of a stop, uh, uh, and then we can guarantee that our registration never fail. Would that be, uh, I guess, uh, suitable for for the for this API? I mean, so our registration fault handler means we don't care, like you said, and they will never fail. Yeah, my my concern was that in the previous in the previous iteration, uh, the unregistration could fail, and then the question was, what what does VFIO do at that point? So it just seemed like we needed to make the un the registration not fail. But I agree with the concern of how do we make sure the device yeah. then stops. It's a little bit beyond you know, it, a software. It, is that going to be part of the assignable interface to uh, the no. SVA device to make it stop using? I can bring this question back to the whoever write this back. And okay. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit beyond I mean, software. It, maybe if we're tearing it down or essentially doing an FLR sort of thing on the AI, then yeah, that could be per device implementation as well. But right. spec-wise, I agree they should be something, yeah, to make sure it's clean between lives, yeah. And and then another uh, point is uh, uh, open. Uh, when we need to support a mediated device, meaning uh, we uh, today we have only per per physical device assignment, and and then. Uh, the fault handling is also per physical device. I, I want to add a multiple uh, multiple data per pass, basically per passive fault handling handling data, such that when one per passive fault handle uh, per passive fault happens, we can report to the to the device driver uh, with appropriate data. So oh, you mean just a voice star? What's that? Sorry. You mean just a, a voice star argument that we pass back to the handler? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but but today we only have per device level, okay. but we need to have uh, basically add more more like a IRQ vector. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that. And, and, uh, I think we have to wrap okay. it up. Sorry. Yeah, maybe uh, we can follow up later session. in yeah. the micro uh, yeah. the conference or well the BRF on Wednesday. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Hello, my name is Cornelia Hook. I'm working for Red Hat. I'm mainly doing S390 virtualization. And that's where I basically come from, mainframe stuff. I've been doing virtualization for some years now, and I'm mainly looking at this from the VFIO perspective, not so much from IOMMU side. So what I basically want to talk about, or more aptly put, get people to be of to, to discuss and so on, is that we sometimes have really weird stuff happening on different architectures. I notice this quite often with, um, with my mainframe perspective. I see patches posted and they are often assuming everything is PCI. No, it's not. Or that everything is working somehow in a way that is similar to what x86 is doing and that's also obviously not what is happening. Those guys of you who are doing ARM or power or whatever uh, will have encountered that same problem, I guess. So 
what I really want to do here is not really talk about the points I have on the slide here. That's what mainly when I was just thinking about stuff, what is really things I have seen that are problematic. There's the classic, of course, the engine stuff. It's not as important for VFIO. It's more important in other areas. But there's also stuff that is not so quite obvious. One of my favorite kind of examples is PCI on the mainframe. PCI on the mainframe is just not what you expect PCI to be. It is using some instructions, no memory map I.O. So it's totally crazy, basically. <laughs> and another example also from the mainframe side is that our actually main set of devices we are using is not PCI at all. It happens on other architectures as well that you have non-PCI devices, but for SV90, the actual main set of devices you are using is CCW channel I.O. devices, which work in a completely different way. You don't use the, the normal IOMMU uh, in interactions because it's basically done by the hardware. You send a channel program there, it does the translation, then it does stuff. And that's something where people are just looking at me with big eyes and it's not like PCI on x86. No, it's not. <laughs> Actually, the channel I.O. instructions that we're using today is from the 1980s, so it's much newer. <laughs> <laughs> so what I wanted to do is start discussion, start awareness. And I, what I also wanted to do, what was my cunning plan, is not to do much of the talking, but let you do a little, little, little bit of the talking and just bring up stuff from ARM, from power, from whatever, where you notice that there are assumptions made by people coming from x86 platforms, which are not quite true on your platforms. So just that people have heard about it, that they can keep in the back of their mind okay, I'm designing something, I have a new feature, and it might not just work like I think, like people with that background might think it works. So does anybody has any weird examples to share? Or something just which has come up repeatedly which just didn't work out like they thought it would work out? Eric mentioned one earlier, the MSI mapping on ARM. Pretty weird. Oh, weird. <laughs> 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 uh, that's a good answer. Uh, um, I have another one. Uh, level triggered MSIs. <laughs> yeah. What? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have that in your hardware, don't laugh. It's good. You, you know you want it. D on PCI Express are effectively level triggered exactly. MSIs. Uh, and you have a lot of interesting problems that you think about if they get stuck to one in a bridge, for example, because you just FLR'd, you or killed your device while it had raised it, but didn't send the go down message. Um, yeah, there's a lot of interesting issues with them. Um, that's why you, any sane virtualization system, modern, modern ones these days, refuses to pass through stuff with an LSI. Um, just don't. Um, Struct was well, a whole IOMU subsystem originally. Uh, was very, very much designed around uh, x86, and it was very, very difficult to adapt it to power, as you, uh, as you may remember. Uh, but I mean, it's Linux, right? See, the, the, the first one to propose something wins, and if you haven't been following LKM, which nobody does, you miss that something was happening, and so you don't get involved because you're busy doing something else. And by yeah, the time yeah, yeah. you realize it's all upstream, and then you want to do your own thing, and you really, really struggle. But I noticed that too that that power is only using uh, the IOMU groups, but nothing else from the IOMU code. So, and I wondered always why this is, and maybe you can explain what's so different about the power IOMU. Uh, honestly, um, last I've looked at the details of that a while ago. Um, Uh, there's a whole history behind that. I think probably because we had our <laughs> own infrastructure that was there and different in software. And the fundamentally, 
uh, the original Flower Emblem were simpler. They didn't have trees. Uh, they were just tables. Uh, the, the grouping was not as arbitrary as what we can do in Linux, but that has changed over time. We used to have, for example, the address space being shared between all the groups. We just had segments of it assigned to groups. That has changed. So depending on the generation of power system, a uh, lot of those assumptions that things could be arbitrarily mapped and device could be arbitrarily put into groups uh, were not true. They became true with later implementation of power, but they were not initially. Um, the but uh, yeah, a lot of it is just uh, inertia. We had a whole infrastructure built and working on the different software model. Uh, and so switching to the IO MMU group model would have required pulling everything out. Part of our problem power, yes, is we have a hypervisor. And we have a hypervisor that doesn't work like any other hypervisor. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, a, it's a hypervisor that requires hypercalls for absolutely everything uh, you want to do uh, short of breathing. And uh, which interface that makes assumptions about how you do DMA and devices that looks a lot what, what AIX does and pretty much nothing to do with what Linux does. Um, and well, we say we are not involved with power anymore. But uh, yes, a lot of, of what was driven by that. So, okay, for example, yeah, but so we had no control of the groups uh, in the guests, for example. The group was set by the hypervisor for us, and, and we had no control whatsoever. Okay. Mm -mm. Yeah, but I, I was just about to say that uh, we currently have the Virtio IMMU, which is also a Virtio an IMMU which runs in a hypervisor. So, but your one is probably different. But then we, yeah, but uh, when KVM came around the corner, we we started also doing. Uh, so Virtio IMMU is something that could be useful on power. I'm pretty sure for for the KVM case because we've been emulating the power hypervisor IMMU APIs in the guests. And so we have on power today and had for pretty much ever. The hypercalls that allow the guest to put translation into an IMMU. Uh, and we then went through iteration of how we're going to actually handle that on the host side. In part because we had some fast paths to get those things in what's called real mode with MMU off in the host. Don't get me started. Uh, we'll still be here tomorrow. But it was really difficult. We couldn't even do a get page. Uh, we didn't access uh, in the implementation of these things if we want them to be fast. We couldn't uh, do uh, access most of Linux basic primitives because we didn't have access to the kernel virtual address space. Um, and so, yeah, a lot of these things bit make things a bit more tricky because this is not really how the thing was thought out. But eventually, I think, especially Alexa managed to get things working. Uh, it's not always, not always very pretty, but uh, big questions also that came up. Because we started having an IMMU in the guest early on, when do we pin the pages? And if we pin at the point where the, the guest put the translation in, that means the guest can now arbitrarily choose to pin uh, page and unpin pages. How is that accounted uh, in the host? Uh, how do we set limits? What happens if you hit the limit because we can't fail an IOMMU uh, insertion? No driver no, can deal with that properly. And I'm reasonably sure that about 90% of the network drivers out there, if they fail at time of translation, are going to be very, very, doing very, 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 very bad things to you. Uh, they, the, they don't, for example, put in a ring instead a pointer to a dummy page, which is what we should be doing, so that the device don't start writing to some stale translation somewhere. Mm. Um, so it's it, it's complicated. There's lots of history there. Let's, let's stop because I, I could go forever. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Other so examples. there's there's lots of history always involved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So does anybody of you have some quirks basically on how devices are being used? One thing I noticed is when I was talk uh, when we, there was that patch set coming up for migration of devices. For, attached via VFIO. And I always assumed that everybody who wanted to migrate a guest from system A to the system B had the assigned device as, uh, accessible by both systems. But it seems that's a rather exotic case, which I thought was the more the default case that everybody wanted to use. So do you guys, can you think of any, anything like that where you made assumptions which just did not turn out to be true? Well, Linux has one assumption that has been a 
sad thing for, for some, well, I'm pretty sure for us friends as well, the, the one that you cannot migrate if you have assigned devices. It's, you, it's in the box. Because uh, uh, uh. we, we have hardware that can migrate DM pages with Cinefly DMA. From, oh, you can also not move pages that are currently used for DMA. We can. We have hardware to do that. But there is no way to plumb that into Linux. There is no relationship between the guts of the migrate page in the VM and uh, whatever DMA mapping I am in your API, we might know whether there is something mapped on that page or not. In fact, it doesn't even know. So w AX wants that, but we can't give it to them in KVM because we have no, Linux was designed around the idea that you will never, ever, ever have to do something like this. But to support migration on live, live migration on guests with assigned devices, you need uh, at least access and dirty bits, n at least dirty bits for I IOMMU, IOMMU right? page tables, right? Then you need at least ex uh, dirty bits for IOMMU page tables, right? To not lose any in-flight DMA. That or active cooperation with the driver, which is harder. The act of cooperation is probably what we're working on with MDEV, though. So. It's the way that we work. I mean, DM, dirty bits, I mean, some do, some don't. Uh, yeah. Active cooperation with the driver, probably the best of this stuff. I mean, the, the easy way is you use a suspend resume callbacks and find a way to stream the harder state. Uh, so. That makes it less live. Yes, it does. Yeah, I mean, for CCW, what I actually plan to do to support migration is have some kind of Quisking, which is easy to do because it's always a channel program which is set yeah. on and you can just wait if it's idle and then migrate it over and then restart it again. That should be yeah. not too hard. To but, for say, yeah. but for memory mapped I.O., it's obviously a much more difficult than it was problem. Yeah. Mind you, talking about something uh, different and in this case, if you uh, did I see something on risk file for CSRs? No, no, uh, <laughs> so, 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 somebody knows. I thought, uh, I've seen something that looks dangerously like having a sideband bus to control the devices that is not ordered with the main data path. Uh, yeah? Doesn't ring any bell? No risk five people around? CSRs. Mike, uh, you mean the attribute, uh, attribute, uh, GV, uh, how to say that? I forgot. We, we, the the guest model changed to the hyperverse model CSR issue. No, okay, let's, let's move on. Uh, I, maybe I, I missed something. There, there have been people in the past who've been doing that, and it's evil. Uh, having effectively a separate bus to send commands with separate instructions that is not in order with your main data path. Uh, PCI order? Ordered in general. I mean, what, whether this is a PCI ordering mechanism or some other ordering mechanism, but at least there is one. So you would just include like the end Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we have known there is some cell processor-based machines where something lovely like this, where you had no way to stop the DMA engine of the descent controller and know for sure that it had finished pushing all buffer data into memory. And so you're changing your MTU. You have to free and relocate all the packet buffer, but you don't know when this thing has stopped actually writing to memory. Yeah, it's hardware, guys. <laughs> Always coming up with funny <laughs> ideas. Well, you put a delay and assume that the thing you're never going to be stuck in the bridge more than that. But <laughs> it's wishful thinking sometimes. So that would be the wait and hope for the best approach. <laughs> that was a lot of what the cell processor was about, mind you. Um, Cornelia, yeah, well, I don't know. I mean, I, I think we have to stick to the shadow. I mean, yeah. given that it's an open-ended question I, I don't know if you want to summarize it somehow for the audience so that maybe we can discuss it further the following days what i had is less of a question it is really more that i wanted to just pull together several things which are different on different architectures which we should keep in mind 
I've now heard about that weirdness on power, which is really, yeah, mm. I don't want to work with it. <laughs> but it's, it's just something that I had noted that so many people are coming from x86 PCI perspective. And I just wanted to raise awareness here. OK, there's different stuff. If you are doing something, just stop for a moment and think, is that what I am doing? more PCI specific, more x86 mm -hmm. specific, or is it really something more general? So if, if it is more general, please try to check in with mm -hmm. other architecture specialists. Uh, 30 seconds on this one. Uh, first is keep in mind, you have the, you have the weirdest archi architecture of all. <laughs> 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 uh, but uh, yeah, on PCI, you want bad one. Uh, if you know hardware design or R1 yourself, uh, do not have DMA address bit limitations, please. Not everybody has its memory from 0 to 40 something bits, uh, or maybe 52 if you're lucky. Uh, some machines have a different layout, and, if you div and there is no standard mechanism whatsoever for hardware to expose its capabilities. The drivers might in some circumstances, and Linux is very, very, very bad at dealing with those restrictions. So yeah, just don't. Anybody have any other points? So it's not IO and MU related, but it's IO and MMU related, which is the semantics of IO remap. So I, I updated the, one of the many useless documents in the documentation to deal with IO remap. But there's also IO remap WC and IO remap no cache. Mm -hmm. And I don't think anyone knows what they mean, <laughs> except. I tried, I oh, okay, it's even better than that. I, I, I tried to <laughs> get some kind of agreement of what they mean. So the problem is, what is the meaning, the semantic, especially in terms of ordering of um, an access to a region that is mapped with some of those attributes? And how does it match us again between architectures? What are the effects of bias? And what is the relationship between those access and the access made to different memory types, such as normal IRM between map WC and normal IRM map, or between that and cacheable accesses? And I'm pretty sure every single architecture gets it different. And yeah, it's, I don't think so. And, uh, and I'm pretty sure drivers get it wrong. Um, and there is no clear semantic. And the kernel doesn't expose even basic guarantees. That's, you know, we have a lot of very strong guarantee exposed on normal IRM map uh, of ordering between accesses, between accesses and DMAs, uh, or in memory and cacheable accesses, and all of that. It's all very strong and very strict. Uh, you can be even stronger, I suppose, if you want to, but at least we have those guarantees. We have none documented on any of the other uh, memory types whatsoever. Uh, and yeah, it's a free for all. We should try to fix that one day. <laughs> You've <laughs> you and I. <laughs> or was I it the royal we? Well, I think Will and I are the two more familiar <laughs> with the problem, probably in the community, <laughs> to be honest. Um, but yeah. Well, thank you for f at least formalizing the correct semantics of the normal MMAOs. Yeah, it's really difficult if you understand it, to get formalizing and write everything to your mind. Yeah. 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 Okay. And, uh, and uh, in this guide, I remember WC red combine. Mm, before that, uh, we, we don't re implement this, this API. So, that's uh, definitely uh, is de definitely used uh, strong order to map, and I found some problem because in hardware strong order could not could not could not, could not uh, uh, process alignment problem, and uh, it will will deal with some alignment <laughs> issues, and uh, so we just uh, take off the uh, strong order attribute for the I remember WC, which is also what we want to right? Yeah, and uh, on Power PC, we also remove the guarded bit, which technically means remove the strong order bit. We get away with it because the semantic of cache inhibited space without that bit is still reasonably palatable. Uh, and we do shovel buyers inside of the accesses as well. Uh, interestingly enough, the way we do it on Power PC means that if you use Rytel on the WC mapping, you will not get combining. <laughs> you need to use a row because we have a full sync, like a full heavyweight bias in every right L. 
uh, pretty much to keep the, um, the synchronization with, uh, uh, with cacheable uh, memory. And so ideally, uh, WC will have its own set of read L writes or whatever, which becomes a mess. Uh, we have a combinatorial explosion of uh, accesses and, uh, and, and memory space types. I'm not sure what the right answer to that is. We, oh. we can document that it doesn't do what you expect. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> I think yeah. uh, I have to stop it, but I'm happy to take a couple of, uh, well, two examples uh, mentioned, and probably we can discuss them further on Wednesday if there is time, or well, in the conference, I mean, it can be something that can be uh, discussed. Let's find a way forward. But well, for the time being, thank you very much. And Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. yeah. Thank you all for your stories. Now we have two topics that are uh, strictly related on resource allocation. I mean, starting with John and optional or reduced PCI bar. So thank you, John. Am I on? OK. Uh, my name is John Derrick. I'm with uh, Intel's um, division which deals with the uh, non-volatile storage host storage software. Um, today I want to talk about uh, what we can do to uh, make sure that uh, mandatory bars are successfully allocated uh, as well as talk about what we can do about uh, bars which are not mandatory, uh, whether we can allocate them or not, and how you know, if we need to reduce them um, in order to allocate them. So the, the first thing I want to do is talk about what is a required and what is an optional bar. Um, so for, for my main example, I want to talk about NVMe. Uh, we have NVMe bar zero, which is a mandatory bar. It's the register set. And then any other NVMe bar, the MMIO bars, um, that it, those are the controller memory buffer and or the persistent memory region. So in NVMe terminology, the controller memory buffer is anything that the controller can handle uh, that is volatile. So this could be uh, scattergather lists, PRPs, which is a form of scattergather lists, uh, submission queue entries, completion queue entries, uh, write data, and read data. And the persistent memory region is similar, but it's a non-volatile region. Uh, so this is typically um, on the order of a lot, a lot more memory than just the normal uh, controller memory buffer. So the problem statement that I want to talk about is uh, the limited resources on these PCI domains often, they, they don't often allow for the use of these optional bars. So the, the CMB, we don't get to use it. The, the PMR, we don't get to use it. Uh, all we have is the mandatory NVMe bar, for example. Uh, the second use, or the second issue is that the um, max, for, max first resource assignment that we have in the resource assignment code, um, typically uh, will assign you know, the, the, most, uh, the most required sizes first. So you could end up with an optional bar of, say, you know, several megabyte size being assigned before 
the required bar, uh, for example, 16 kilobytes. So let me just rewind for a minute. Mm -hmm. uh, the all of this stems from the fact that we also don't have a way today to specify to the generic code what is optional and what is required, correct? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yep, so I'll get to that. Yeah, and then the, the third point on this slide is it's kind of a combination of the first two. Uh, so if you have limited resources in your PCI domain and your max first resource assignment code, you can get uneven resource assignments. So to, to show that as, as an example, I'll show you my uh, PCI domain, my example PCI domain. So this is a typical PCI domain that I work with. Uh, you might have a uh, report with 64 megabytes of non-prefetchable memory, um, same with the set of prefetchable memory. You have an eight port uh, switch and then a set of endpoints. So on this slide you can see that we have a an uneven allocation. Uh, we've been able to successfully assign the, all of the required bars in this case. Th these are assuming this is NVMe. So we've been, we've been able to assign all these non-prefetchable uh, resources, but we have an uneven uh, assignment for the prefetchable resources, which means that four of these devices could potentially be using CMD or PMR, and four of the devices could not be uh, this makes kind of an uh, odd user experience for um, users, especially when we're, uh, if, if the peer-to-peer -peer DMA work gets developed more in the future, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to show some weird latencies between siblings. How does it even work? I mean, you can not on PCI disable individual bars. So if a bar has not been assigned, in theory, you must not enable the entire device because the bar is actually assigned to something you don't want. Right. Uh, in practice, you make it to sign on top of RAM, and so it's never going to be reached. Right. But it's still not correct. Right. So that's kind of where I was going with this. So, yeah. uh, so you don't, uh, especially with the NVMe case, uh, you don't necessarily need these optional bars. If we can assign them to where they can't be reached, then there is no problem, or is there a problem? Uh, as long as we can get to this NVMe register set on bar zero, then we can successfully use the NVMe bar. Uh, the optional bar just doesn't get used. But that's presumed that we have an accepted way of leaving an unassigned bar into a region that is not mapped into the parent bridge. That's correct. Which we may or may not have, because we could have cases where, I mean, we don't, we don't know that for sure, right? We could have a gigantic bar that goes beyond the size of system RAM and behind the switch, and that switch is open to everything else. I don't know, we, we have no guarantee that we can even do that. I mean, short of having a device that supports resizable bars, which nobody does, as far right. as I know. Yeah. Um, uh, this, we can, I mean, we can look at trying to do mm -hmm. it, but it, there are going to be some interesting heuristics in the code, which I'm mm -hmm. not particularly fan of. So, so the main reason I want to talk about this is because uh, the persistent memory region is, a, is an MMIO space of non-volatile memory. Uh, non-volatile byte accessible memory is become, becoming really uh, affordable, and we expect to see larger devices uh, <laughs> with these regions. So. You, um, are you in control of the actual devices? Are you designing them yourselves? I'm, or? I'm no. No? Yes? No. No, you purchase, you are, you're buying somebody else's PCI device and putting it into your system. Uh, well, I'm just saying because there is a way to try to solve that problem that has been used by, I believe, at least AMD, which is to have the bar initially come up with a small size and then have the driver uh, call a kernel API that exists today to resize it. Are you talking about resizable bar? The no, not the PCI the resizable bar stuff. Okay. Um, I think they, they basically, I don't think they use that. They basically, they did. oh, they did in the newer stuff? Yeah. Okay, because at some point, I remember some devices that basically did the hard way. So they, 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 it comes up as a normal bar of a small size. And then the driver does something to the device that changes the bar sizing and then recall the resource allocation within. Yeah, they're using the standard PCI resizable Okay. Oh. Sorry, I was saying the AMD cards do use the standard PCI resizable bar. These days, okay. 
So that, that technically is a way to solve that. So, well, it doesn't, provided we handle it properly on Linux, which is a whole different kettle of fish, and then we haven't even thrown a hot plug wrench into your yeah, beautiful the picture over there. Is, is um, but. Uh, yeah, so, so to your point, uh, the main problem with the endpoint is that there's no way to say, you know, my endpoint is this size. I would like it to be this size. Um, that's where I, I, I'd like to consider this, this uh, limiting it at the bridge upstream of the endpoint instead. Uh, ah. So instead we have a more fair allocation. We've been able to limit it at the bridge because you can, you can specify the limits at the bridge. But um, not per device. What's that? Not per device. I mean, how, how can you change the size of the bar on a device? Don't you don't change the size of the bar. You, you can see in this, in this example that we have prefetchable 16 still. But we've limited the address range. Oh, the DSPs input. are bridges. And, and the main, the main yes. reason, so, so a little more background. NVMe, um, the way we have the CMB set up right now is with uh, just, a peer, just a generic allocator. So if we can limit that uh, allocator pool to that eight, eight megabytes in this example, okay, then we never hit that address so, range. So th th this is, okay, so th this is based, so I, I completely miss the fact that your DSP things were bridges. Mm -hmm. So they are basically the uh, downstream ports of the switch. That's correct. Okay, yeah, that makes more sense. Um, so yeah, I mean, in, in, in your specific case, your, your hack works. Uh, the problem, of course, is it uh, only works as long as it's a single endpoint you have be below that leg. Uh, you have multiple functions or SRIOV or any other thing that happens these days, it's gonna stop working. So do you have, or should, uh, probably your next slide, I don't know. Do you have uh, th well, some thoughts about how to enable such a mechanism uh, that will not cause other th things to break horribly? Uh, I haven't thought about that, but there is there is the concern. Uh, I think you're getting to this point. So um, there's the concern, you know, address space violation uh, al aliasing. Um, if, if one device aliases into the next, I think that's kind of what you were getting at. Uh, well, yeah, because those devices are effectively going to be decoding 16 meg. Uh, and so if you have more than one below that bridge, uh, how do you arrange them in a way? I mean, you, you, you basically won't be able to do it uh, because of the natural of the line. Now the windows are not aligned. Yeah, you might still be able to play funny games, but it's the, uh, the resulting assignment algorithm become unmanageable itself. And you've seen the catastrophe that is our existing uh, <laughs> resource allocation <laughs> algorithm. Uh, we want to talk about that later. Um, yeah. Sorry, I, I missed how this actually solved the problem. How, how does PCI, when enumerating this bridge, recognize that there's eight megs on the downstream port and therefore it can assign a 16 meg? Well, they did the, the hacks. They so right right now we we go go all the way down and we we calculate how much you know memory we need at all the endpoints and then we come back up and re or we assign everything based on that. So instead we would collect uh, all of the uh, resource requirements on every single endpoint. Uh, we would distribute it uh, fairly and fairly is a policy. So fairly to all of the DSPs and that would be our limits to each of the endpoints. But how does PCI know that this works for any given device? It doesn't today. Right. No, so this would be, uh, this would be part of uh, the whether or not the device could be have optional bars or not. So we there, there is a bunch of things like this. I mean, again, if you, it's one of those kind of worms. If we open, we, we're going to stay forever on it. But so I'll try to be brief if I can. This hot plug, a whole bunch of other things like this. Um, I bring a couple of problems that we have that are completely structural to the way we do PCI on Linux. One is that the entire assignment is done before we even talk to the driver. Uh, and we don't have any way to have driver coordinate before things get assigned. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but then hot plug gets another wrench. We don't have a way at runtime to tell drivers, sorry guys, I'm gonna have to reassign everything. Get off for a bit. Which I believe Windows has. Um, okay, I haven't seen that. Because we want to be able, especially with Thunderbolt, so Thunderbolt is the elephant in the crystal mm -hmm. shop, right? <laughs> People are 
coming on your system that has a you know, 16 meg hot plug window on your yeah. bridge and bring a two gig and Thunderbolt GPU could be like six uh, levels behind three. five bridges yeah. plus two mm -hmm. XHCIs and God knows what else, and then try to delete chain another one. Uh, and there's no way your boot time allocation will be able to fit any of that. Um, and so sh we, we have tricks to try to reallocate within the context of things that have not had any allocation before. But you get weird things. If you boot with a device plugged in, you're going to get something different than if you boot without the device plugged in. Mm -hmm. And then. STB. Uh, no, no, so there's yet a new invention by Intel that, uh, <laughs> that I don't know about, <laughs> or something else. Could you pass my? Yeah, yeah, but the PCI standard grows about 12 standard every minute. None of them are implemented by anybody, uh, <laughs> and it's impossible to follow. So um, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, we, but there is even more basic things like this. For example, you mentioned non-prefetchable, right? Uh, you're lucky. Yours are small. Uh, not always, especially with SRI of it. And conveniently, PCI never thought to put a 64-bit non profitable window in the bridges. Uh, now, PCI Express has this interesting little blurb in the spec that says that actually you can put uh, non profitable bars into bridge profitable <laughs> windows, uh, which could be the only way to deal with that in some cases, but Linux is far from being able to exploit that as far as I know. And I say something I don't know about happening somewhere. <coughs> um, but yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a, it's a mess, mm -hmm. but it brings up, uh, yeah. So do you, are you proposing like some kind of quirk mechanism for a vendor device ID saying? I, I, well, yes, I, I kind of am. So, I mean, you could do, you could do something like a uh, lookup in a, in the driver itself, but the driver hasn't bound at that time. So it would be something probably appropriate for the PCI layer. You would have a class code. The NVMe, for example, would um, have an optional bar. This, it would say the optional bar in the minimum size. Yeah. Uh, for other devices, I'm I'm not I'm not sure. Yeah, you could easily. I mean, in this case, you've got bars that are optional, and you can run all these devices without them. But you can easily imagine a different case where devices will not work if they don't get what they require. So you exactly, you need yeah. the exact opposite. So, yep. so it ideally, in the grand scheme of things, you would want a flag in a in a resource flag that tell you whether the thing is optional. Uh, you might want even more than that. Is it optional? Is it optional at any size? Or is it a binary thing? And and the problem of is you have no communication with the driver to be able to, to yeah. establish that, uh, short of having quirks. And right. I, I've been trying to think of ways where we could talk to drivers before they get formally bound, and that's never going to work. Uh, and then I tried to figure out whether we could find a way where we would um, delay the resource allocation until drive after all drivers are bound on a given segment. But there is so much existing code that makes assumptions that this is not the case. That uh, short of having some kind of flag in a struct PCI driver that says this driver can do that, and do it only if every driver for everything on that bus has a flag set, uh, it, it's it's difficult. But uh, yeah, I need to learn a bit more about what you mentioned, the idea of telling driver that we're going to reallocate everything. So that's going to be useful if we can make it work. So in, in your case, you could, we could do a quirk. Uh, it's nasty because it's competitive specific, uh, <coughs> and it's in the core kernel, it's ugly, but it's sort of doable. Uh, but then we would have to put the infrastructure in allocators to understand the meaning of that quirk and deal with it. Are you keen in making that allocator even more complicated than it already is? <laughs> well, this overlaps a lot with my slot uh, later on uh, yeah. resource allocator, and it opens all sort of questions. I mean, should have, should we have some kind of more transactional allocator where you sort of recreate the whole view of the world of what you want to create and only commit it if we decide it's better than the one we had before, mm -hmm. and we can potentially run through different algorithms until and have some form of formal metrics to decide what it mean, what better means. And mm -hmm. can we even create those? The so solution of all solutions, yeah. It's, <laughs> yeah. OK, so I, uh, I have another reason for the mandatory and optional bars. Um, and uh, I'll show you uh, a, another use case. So uh, this was a use case uh, that I ran into. I had a root port with uh, non-prefetchable 64 megabytes 
and they prefetchable was less than one megabyte, and that's because it contained MSIX. So there was no, there was no prefetchable space for uh, subordinate bus. Um, the max first resource assignment code assigned the prefetchable bar first on the endpoint, <coughs> and then the non-prefetchable was completely disabled. So this device was effectively useless, even though the NVMe driver bound to it, uh, and that's the piece of code that says we can we can do this. Mm -hmm. So if we had these this mandatory and uh, optional bars, then you know, something like this wouldn't happen. PCI enabled resources should have failed, though, no? The driver should have failed at prop time, no? I did not see that. No. I thought we were checking that we had correct allocation on every bar. Mind you, uh, we, we don't remember your, on iOS space at least, otherwise we'll break your own file, but we might have a bug. Right. Um, so it, it, it probably did fail because it would have tried to read bar zero. But still, it's, if it fails, then you know, when, it, when it could have succeeded, then that's kind of undesirable. It's undesirable to do it at that point in time. Uh, I agree. Uh, no, I agree. Too. So uh, a second pass might be. Yes. A second um, But that brings back the opposite of simulation, which is the opposite one, where we technically cooled on PCI Express, put the non prefetchable one into the prefetchable mm -hmm. window, because in practice, usually the prefetchable one are the big ones, and non prefetchable one are the small ones. So. Yeah. The, the difficulty when you touch anything in that code mm -hmm. is you can be pretty sure you're going to break something mm -hmm. somewhere. Many some obscure x86 machine you know, that happens to work despite some hidden devices we don't know about. But we change something in the algorithm and suddenly we start overlapping those hidden devices and boom. Mm -hmm. uh, so you need a lot of testing, but. Yeah, I think it makes sense, Bjorn, to, uh, to delay uh, the attempt at allocating prefetchable bars into non-prefetchable window until after we have handled the non-prefetchable bar into the non-prefetchable window. I mean, fundamentally, the reason we didn't care is that in theory, unless you have assigned all the bar of a device, you cannot use that device. We have that assumption in yeah. theory. Uh, we might have bugs in the code that's supposed to enforce it, uh, so I think the first thing you need to do, and I don't disagree with it, uh, is have that concept that a bar we couldn't assign can be left in a place where it's harmless, mm -hmm. which means outside of the reach of its parent bridge. And we need to be able to then not only do that, then verify that we could, and if we can't, we have to refuse enabling the device. Um, and it needs to work even in context where we might do games of resize on bridge or something like this in the future. And so we need some flags to mark these things, this needs to be and stay out of the way. Um, if we have that and we agree on that, then yes, as a second step, having this idea that the shuffling that code to favor some bars versus others on the grounds that uh, we can survive if those aren't under some circumstances, yeah, maybe, why not? Another aspect to that, of that, of the problem is, uh, I, I think we assign by category regardless of the device, right? We assign all of the uh, non prefetchable of all the devices, then we go to all the non prefetchable mm -hmm. and and so the, the the ordering had this idea that some device that oh, we don't have the concept that some devices are more required than others. Yeah, and and that's also a problem. We have system devices that must be assigned, or nothing will work. While well, your Thunderbolt adapter, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But that, you know, at least you can boot your machine. So it's an, it's another part of that same discussion. Uh, to I don't I don't know, John, if you I don't know. What's the way forward you want to put something uh, where you keep it as a NVMe solution and or? Uh, well, you it needs to solve those problems in the core first yeah. because those are in the core. But yeah, th this needs this probably needs to uh, 
to exist with in yeah. a kind of uh, resource allocation rewrite. So, so, I mean, just for a matter of keeping time, I mean, um, unless you have something you want to ask the audience, I think given that Benjamin topic is quite related to this one, maybe we yep. can follow on and just uh, keep discussing the resource allocation. We're probably going to also use the both <laughs> as well. Yeah, I but reckon. I think they talk a bit, unless you have something else you want to ask specifically. No, What's your current uh, workaround? I mean, I assume you have a way to get things working now. Is that something that we should uh, There is no current about? workaround. So we've, we've asked our um, firmware teams, our, our, sorry, not our firmware. Our, our BIOS and firmware to allocate more space. Uh, and that's actually kind of w another one I want to show you. So that's a um, one where the slot's not occupied at the top. The BIOS uh, didn't leave us enough room for anything, basically, because there was a management handle in the upstream port. Um, so we've, we've asked our uh, firmware team to kind of work with a lot of these things. Uh, but you, you can't trust any vendor platform BIOS. That's why we have PCI equals realloc. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. No, so I'm going to take it for here for, from here for reasons. Uh, reasons. I am not of oh, technical. I will set fire to the PR people. <laughs> well, I don't. I, I, I didn't end up making any slides. I, I can go up there if you want. Okay. <laughs> it will save me having to set fire to them. Are you making a list? I will. I am. I'll have to try to make XIBM, you can <laughs> uh, All right, so PCI resource allocation. We, we started, so we, we just con we continue on on what you started. Um, the, we have a bunch of problems, uh, to say the least, and part of them uh, relate to uh, the way we, on one hand, try to honor what the firmware has done, and on and 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 may or may not decide it was correct or not, and try to reassign some things, and then come back later and look at oh we have hot blackberry we have some space left let's see if we can spread it and do all those kind of very heuristic-y things to try to get things working. And then we have a whole pile of different platform and architectures that don't do that, and they decide to just purely um, reassign everything from scratch, uh, based on the idea that Linux will always, will always do better than whatever you boot did on this machine, and that's probably a fair assumption. Um, and then we have platform will do a bit of an in-between, uh, and some architectures have policies per box, more or less, not clear. Um, and, and, and all of that, so, Sorry, I'm, I'm, I might be starting in the wrong order here. The, if we want to start fixing some of the location problem, we need to probably, we probably want to do it in a way that is not XLTX specific. Uh, or ARM specific, of course, or anything. And we want to try to consolidate a little bit across the board how we are doing things on PCI when it comes to resource allocation and management across all architectures. This is the first thing I wanted to look at. Uh, so I started unwinding some of the string you've been unwinding, and I realized that um, a lot of the, the code is a, a cross between what's in the architecture code, what Architecture 6 does, with the two paths claiming of existing resources that it has uh, versus realloc, and then a bunch of architectures do something completely different. ARM64 at the moment, uh, at least since the DSM pad that went in, Tina, finally, um, was just reallocating everything like ARM32. Almost all embedded 
devices decide that whatever might have existed before is pointless and irrelevant and let's just reassign everything, uh, most of them forget to tell the court to reassign bus numbers. So, uh, it tends to work because Linux tends to be reasonably good at figuring out that they're wrong and reassigning them in a specific thing anyway. But there is a, a mess of policies and there is no consistency in how those policies are implemented. Uh, there have been some improvements in recent years in functions being created in a generic code such as PCI claim resources, I think, or something like this, bus resources, which try to consolidate some of the non x 86 uh, uh, attempts at claiming existing resources set by the firmware. Uh, and then PC people have been calling PCI allocate, uh, unallocated resources as a way to uh, claim the rest, to assign the rest and then claim it. Um, but most uh, controllers in the embedded world actually don't do that and they sort of manually call lower level functions, two of them, to do the bus sizing and then the allocation. So PBUS sizes resources and whatever the, its friend is. So it's very, very messy. Um, the way the policy is decided, what to do, whether we want to reallocate everything or whether we want to um, honor what's there and reallocate what's missing or broken uh, or, or whatever. There's actually four different actual policies I've enumerated so far in the kernel. Um, is decided as a side effect of how those calls are made and by whom and where at the moment. There is no clear uh, reasoning about it. Um, it's very hard to reason about it. Um, in many cases, in all the new stuff, all the new device-free based PCI controllers, all the ARM world, et cetera, it's quite nasty. This code is actually done in the PCI controller driver itself. Sometime in the common bit that they try all you to use, but practice only half of them do use. And so there's a lot of duplication of that, those three magic function calls. They may or may not honor probe only, which is a way to tell it to claim the existing stuff instead of reassigning. Um, and none of them implement what you want, Bjorn, which is what x86 does, which is to claim what's there and assign what's missing. None of them do that. None of them ever did. But more than that, the PCI control driver is not the place for that decision. The policy of how resources should be managed on a given platform should not live in the driver for the IP block that is operating as a PCI host bridge. That IP block could be used on x tomorrow, or could be used, well, we have a CPI that, that has everything, but on somewhere else, and, and which might want to have different policy. And we had that problem already on some Amazon stuff with the DSM. Well, that was a CPI, but because ARM64 in a CPI was doing things like ARM32 instead of doing things like x86. Um, so I think I could pull more examples of, of that wrongness. Uh, point is I want to, add, I'm not pretending I'm gonna fix everything here. I, I'm, I'm trying and I've already about sort of 30 or 40 patches. And I need to use another path and clean them a bit. To try to at least do two things, one is have a single function that everybody calls to apply the policy, to do the resource allocation according of the, uh, to the selected policy. Um, and so, and that is a, in many ways a way to try to get rid of all that weird code we have in alpha, HPR risk, et cetera, that tries to use the lower level stuff by hand. The PowerPC one is terrible, I wrote it, um, because it's an, based on an ancient fork of x86 plus other things and I can probably fix it, I haven't fixed it yet. And bring everybody to a single top level thing in the generic code uh, that applies the policy in a consistent way across all architecture. Second problem is where is the policy decision made and that's something I haven't completely solved yet. Uh, and we have a number of global PCI flags we can use for that, that's what PowerPC does today. Uh, we have PCI probe only which is more or less used for that. Um, I, I've been toying with a number of options there and I'm 
we can discuss that more when I, I come back to that. Um, the uh, third, not a problem goal I have, which I haven't achieved yet because I got distracted with other things, is as I moved a lot of that stuff into generic code, I, have s I had to modify a little bit some of that generic code that we don't use on x86, so one that was created for all of the new platforms, solely to take into account some of the subtly different requirements of some of the architecture. There aren't that many of them. Some of them are obscure and could probably be removed. Uh, and I did remove some mo of the most obscure weird stuff from PRISC and Alpha, and I got people to actually test that, and so far it seems to be working. Uh, but things like whether uh, a bar whose value is zero means unassigned, or is it a valid value? And you know, I created a weak helper for the architecture to decide that. Uh, but the default so far has been good enough for almost everybody, which is to decide that it probably is your policies, and yes, you have to honor it. Uh, otherwise, you consider it not allocated. But there are things like this, and, and I'm, I'm trying to bring these things and slowly message that generic code to make it closer to what x86 does until the point where we can remove chunk of x86 and make it user generic code. And, and the reason I'm taking that approach is I'm very wary of changing x86 um, and changing its behavior because we have a very long history of very, very strange things on x86 chipsets. As I said, invisible devices, um, uh, weird BIOS SMM things that boss if you start moving something around, God knows what, right? And it, it's by far, but, but the reason I want to consider people around what SS does is this is by far the most tested uh, platform and architecture we have when it comes to PCI. And so whenever people want to create some, if I, if I, if I achieve my goal, when somebody tomorrow come up with a new bar sizing, sharing, uh, spreading mechanism that works for Thunderbolt and allows you to do all that, it, that thing will also work for the non-x86 architectures. Um, today, for example, the code we have to try to spread across the various hot plug bridges, the remaining space, for example, this thing only works underneath a hot plug bridge. There is actually no reason why we couldn't do that at all. Just that on x86, we never need that. And so the code was written with a deeply bolted assumption in how the code is structured, that it is operating on a, sub, uh, on, on a child bridge somewhere. Uh, that could be a reasonable way to assign root buses, especially since root buses can be hot plugged, uh, on a bunch of, uh, of the non x86 uh, platform. It would also be a reasonable way to do your initial assignment on platforms that want to reassign everything and have a bunch of empty hot plug capable top level bridges. Let's spread what we have available to them. Right? It will be a reasonable way to uh, policy to do that. But the code as structure is incapable of doing it in ways that are not that trivial to, to fix because of how the code is written. You, uh, Benjamin, when you're referring to hot plug, you're referring to the automatic realloc. Now this other one we have that tries to spread the free space. So we have something today where if we detect that we have a bridge that have some, that underneath switch there is a bunch of hot plug uh, legs. So typically a hot plug switch, right? We have a top level, we have a bunch of hot plugs in below it. And there is a bunch of free space that is not used by any of the existing window at the bottom. We actually try to spread it and we basically try to expand the size of all of the hot plug bridge under, underneath to, to, to donate that free space. Again, it's not a panacea. It's not, it's not going to deal with your two gigabyte uh, GPU on Thunderbolt, and that will require more crazy thing that we discussed earlier, such as you know, telling the device to stop reassign things and all of that. But it will generally increase the chances that your hot plug will work for more basic things at least. Um, while the additionally GPU drivers tend to be better at dealing with not being able to get full big bars these days, as I said, we, we're starting to have a resize which helps. In many cases, because we don't actually need to access GPU bars much for graphics. Uh, everything is DMA and, and whatever. Uh, it's not, entirely, not as true with compute, but uh, yeah, the GPU need for the giant hit bars is, is lessening. Um, so yeah, so this is sort of a big uh, overview. Um, 
the, one of the main points of contention I was having with Bjorn Amenlis, and I found that that was something we probably would be better having a, a chat about, was the, the concept of having all the different policies in the first place. You didn't like it, and you wanted everybody to do like aesthetics, which is to effectively apply what's already there, uh, and unless it's broken. And the problem I have with this uh, is, 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 is at least twofold. One is I am wary of changing the fundamental PC allocation strategy done by every embedded device in the next day. Uh, it's a gigantic break if you think switch. Uh, we know on ARM64, for example, Lorenzo, that it does break things. Mm -hmm. um, trying to honor firmware and then reassign, yes. yeah, it will yeah. break. Yeah. 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 And, the, and beyond response to that is, and feel free to, to intervene because we want that to be a conversation. Uh, your response to that was, but if it's broken, we should then reassign. The question becomes, how do you define is broken? And I have not been able to come with a good definition that doesn't involve having Google AI uh, <laughs> look at your PCI allocation and say, mm, I don't like that one. I could do better. Right. So um, here's my problem with this. I think we're saying that the only way to make these ARM embedded systems work is to throw away w what we have and reallocate from scratch. I'm not saying this is... And if, we, not, if we're saying that, what I think you're saying is we're depending on the current Linux allocation strategy. And I don't know how we validate if we change that. How do we validate so it's going to give the same results? The, so that's a good point. We've always had that problem across all the embedded platforms that have yes. where the bootloader's brought up one device to boot from and everything else is up to Linux. We have always had that problem in so Linux, and it's not uh, just PCI resource allocation. You change something, you're trying to make sure it works for everybody, and that's hard when it touches a whole bunch of different platforms, but that is not a new or different issue. It's not, and fundamentally, we do hope, uh, and I think it's a reasonable expectation to, uh, to think that whatever resource allocation strategy we in Linux is capable of creating a functional allocation from a clean slate. <laughs> I think that it's not a, a far-fetched uh, requirement and we, should, we might be able to test. And I'm going to get back to that if I have time, testing. I, mean, uh, I ju just want to mention that, well, trying to honor resor firmware resources on embedded platforms, I mean, the problem was that, for, for instance, some bridges may be under allocated yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so it's not well it's exactly the question you asked it's not it's not necessarily broken yes. but the problem is that it triggers regression yeah, yeah. So there is a whole there's an arm length of prison why it is broken uh, but this is also something you can come up with a test suite for right you can do test cases for the resource allocated without actually I was having going to, to have the board get there um one of the things that i have not had a chance to work on uh, and i want to finish what i'm doing first which is consolidation across architectures. And uh, I want your agreement beyond that you will let me keep that concept of policy because this is what we do today and I don't want to change that as well. We have different policies simply by calling different functions. Uh, I want to have a much, but the, the, this is a thing in common. Well, the thing I don't like about reassign all is I don't think it's... But we do it today. This is how everything works except except six today. I know, but it's, there's there's no semantics. What do you mean? You're not telling us anything about how we ought to do the reallocation. Mm, well, I mean, most of the time, the buyer doesn't know any better. Uh, you boot code is a dumber version of Linux code, right? Uh, it doesn't tr even try to deal with leaving space for hot plug or anything like this. The, the point is, we're talking about platforms where you don't have that information anyway. Um, we could, and, 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 and we can think about ways to improve things on top of that. I'm, there's many uh, uh, things we could improve if it become necessary. We could, as a device tree, tell you that the preferred location for that bridge is that much, and we could honor that, for example. There's all sorts of things we could do. But my point is I want to consolidate what is at the moment a rat nest of different stuff done 
across architectures, control drivers, etc., all over the place, which all boil down to fundamentally applying for three or four different policies. Uh, and I can break that down to a single function that picks a policy. There is a question of how we pick the policy, and there's a couple of fiddly bits there, um, and apply it. Uh, and, and it's actually a pretty nice piece of code it, uh, in a sense that it's pretty clear when you look at this. This is what happens. This is the flow of initializing PCI. It's driven by your policy. There are going to be about two, three, maybe four. Again, there's an issue of how we interpret the DSM stuff, which we can probably need to talk about a bit more. But um, yeah, it, I have no problem with trying to consolidate that. Clean up I don't path. want that to makes change sense. the behavior. You know what I mean? It's the, the changing how we deal with all those embedded platforms that represent everything today. And, and maybe we want to go down that path. I don't know. It's just such a kind of one because I know it will break things. Uh, we have examples. Uh, yeah, that it I, would be I, I want to make it a separate problem. Yeah, it would be useful, I think, to uh, examine some of the problems that we know about in more detail. So I, I feel like we're just one we of haven't the, really one of the common to a root ones. Cause of what the failure is. So one of the common ones is going to be that those platforms are just going to give the entire space to a single bridge, which has a boot device on it, and feed it a hardware address which could be right in the middle of your space. And that's, it's a valid application. It's also a really, really bad one. And if you have a hot plus bridge, for example, then you have nothing left for it. Well, it's still a validation, that, a perfectly valid allocation at both because you haven't plugged anything in hot plus bridge. And then you try to plug something in hot plus bridge and everything falls apart. So, the, and it is a not uncommon example. Um, and U-Boot is not the only bias out there, of course. Uh, U-Boot has gotten better with PCI. Uh, but I, I think it is reasonable to expect, especially with things like Hotplug, where we do the allocation of entire segments and hierarchies of segments ourselves anyway, that Linux has a reasonably trusted way of allocating PCI resources. Fundamentally, in fact, if you think about it, what is the difference between a platform where nothing is allocated from the root down, sorry, nothing is allocated from the root down, versus a platform where some things are there that we don't touch? And then we have this space behind the hot plug bridge where nothing is allocated from the right down until you plug something. And then without touching the top level bridge, right, you now have to allocate everything below that top level bridge. The first case was just a subset of the second case in a way. We, what we do here needs to work. So if it works below a hot plug bridge, may as well work for, the, for, for a platform that doesn't have anything already allocated at all. Um, and, and, and a lot of those platforms are, are, are going to just come up with the, every device uh, in primary set state and nothing in the bar. So we are going to relocate it anyway. So the, the fundamentally, the problem of us being capable of doing the allocation doesn't go away. The, the, it's just that the authors or maintainers of those platforms have made a conscious decision that whatever was there, done, if any, by the firmware, is worthless and should be thrown away. And it's a reasonable thing to do. In many cases, Linux will do much better. But as long as we agree to a different problem, and I, we can at least consolidate what exists today and make it cleaner and easier to work with, uh, we can we can defer that. So do we have that agreement? Yeah, I don't have a problem with uh, cleaning okay. up what's there. And so uh, I can resume. I think we can defer this question about uh, reassign everything. I don't I don't think that's the core piece of the problem. Yeah. So fundamentally, I still have to uh, tackle PowerPC, uh, which I've been procrastinating. Um, also because I don't have any PowerPC anymore. Actually, I still have a D5. Um, but that's okay, I, I don't live very far from those who do. Um, and, and the key thing is going to be the last stage, which is to make things look so much like x86 that we can now make x86 use of the generic code. And that's the holy grail, at least as far as that specific patch is concerned. I might start looking at upstreaming little bits of it early and slowly move to it because otherwise it's gonna be too big. Uh, it's already pretty big as it is, um, and it should be bisectable at this stage. So uh, I, I, I need to go back to it. It's, it's been a couple of months now since last I, I touched. But 
Um, yeah, this is where I want to go. Uh, any comment, discussion, other aspects in that specific area uh, that you want to? Sorry, I'm not sure if it was mentioned. I know testing was briefly mentioned. Oh yeah. yeah how, how are you going to test it? And have you got some, any ideas for generating so PCR topologies? The, the or something? So as it is, the series is hopefully meant to not change anything for what happened before. So I rely a lot on code inspection, of course. Uh, and for the few cases where I had to tear the stuff apart because the theory is for alpha was using antiquated methods that were just completely wrong. Um, I just tried to manage to find a few people who still have those machines and have them basically just test it for me. Uh, is it still booting? Things seem to be working. Your PCI seems to be still assigned properly. Thankfully, those machines tend to not do fancy hot plug balls. Maybe nobody cares anymore. Um, the vast majority <coughs> of systems out there, by far, uh, are just reassigning everything. And I'm not changing that. I'm just changing the way. I'm just making all that open code called a single function, which does the same thing. So I'm hoping that sitting in next for a while will probably not be sufficient for that. Long run, though, uh, I have been thinking, how do we test uh, properly new allocators, new methods, new policies? We want to change. We want to. We think we have a better way of fluffing resources around, such as you know, what you want to do, etc. How do we test that? Um, and how do we test we haven't regressed everybody? And and I, I don't know whether it's something we, we can tackle easily to, uh, in, in, a, in a short term, but it would be nice if we uh, defined a file format that effectively capture the PCI setup of a given system, uh, potentially several with hot plug. Uh, and we create a big database somewhere of these things. And we untangle the resource allocation to code, so it's a bit more self-contained. And we effectively can run it in user space across these things. And what we, what we store is not, we don't just store the uh, PCI layout. We store the PCI layout and what allocation we have done with it. Okay, so that we can spot that whether we've changed something. Doesn't mean we have done a regression, but at least we can apply first a bunch of automated thing to test whether what it looks valid and there's no overlaps and horrible things and this and that. Do you think there's any way we could use like KUnit or something to? I don't know. A piece I, I, of the don't, I honestly don't know. I haven't thought that far, uh, and I'm that not that familiar with KUnit. I know there is in guy no code for he brought a test module for resource allocation if you remember Bjorn right, yeah. Yeah. yeah but the scroll module well I mean I'm throwing mm. tossing ideas around I mean that's yeah uh, uh, my my thinking is that the ideally we need to be able to run something in user space that feeds a large data set that we keep enriching uh, and we find ways to encode in the other nasty bits, such as, oh, that machine type has a region there that does not tell you about what you really shouldn't get to. <laughs> and, and we might be to get to the point where to deal with some of those systems, we actually really have to do a query, and we might have to do that the hard way by breaking them and having somebody who be one of the three people on Earth who have that system, because those things dis are disappearing, right? Uh, hidden devices tend to go away. Uh, in the devices that are not represented by the firmware tend to go away. Um, but yeah, so uh, that's just very, very just high-level thought. I haven't really gone into the details, and I'm not sure I will be the person to have the bandwidth to tackle that in uh, any reasonable time frame from here. Uh, but if somebody is interested, it's definitely something to look into, uh, especially with all that hot plug. Uh, I'm just wondering if you've seen the set that, that uh, is it Sergey something or other was. Uh, yeah. So, so the um, uh, on hot plug it, it would start and stop or it would stop all the devices, re redo all the bus numbers. So yeah, you, that's resources. what you mentioned earlier. Yeah, I haven't seen it. Uh, okay. When when was that posted? It's been posted pretty frequently. I'm just wondering what you think about that approach. Oh, I I, I think. 
we will have to do that for a number of reasons. Um, and, in, and it might uh, be useful for other things, actually, um, such as some of those IMMU problems where if you want to change the grouping or change the policies on existing loaded devices, we have the objectivity to do the same thing. Um, yeah, I, I'm reasonably confident that we will not be able to deal with some of the more crazy sensible things and whatever next is going to come up because I suspect we have just started going down that path uh, of crazy hot plug without having a way to redo allocation with live devices. Uh, and that will require active collaboration. Uh, and the simplest way I can think of doing that is to figure out everybody under the segment of the, the hierarchy uh, that we need to reallocate to be stopped to one another and whether the existing suspend call are sufficient or good for that even, probably not. Some of the suspend call are going to do things like flush the disk cache onto the platter because we're expecting to spin down the disk and then it's going to take uh, 10 seconds to spin it back up. You really don't want to do these things. Uh, some of the stuff we've been doing for suspend to disk, like the spray stuff might be more appropriate. I don't know. I, don't, I, I, I can't tell you today what's the right way to do it. Um, it is all, all pro and cons, right? Uh, adding new callbacks mean yet another set of callbacks into the end never-ending series that most drivers are not ever going to implement. I don't know. Uh, but yes, uh, in principle, something like this uh, appears inevitable to me, unavoidable. Uh, we're going to have to do something like this. Benjamin, for the sake of time, I think uh, we need to give Kishan uh, um, <laughs> time to present his topic. Yeah, but um, I suggest we can uh, keep discussing this in the conference and if you want I we I've can pretty much say everything I wanted to say yeah. so it's mostly about feedback thoughts uh, questions uh, yeah and we maybe we can try to summarize it on Wednesday in uh, the BOF yeah at the BOF or uh, uh, yeah. in the corridors or whatever yeah and yeah. If, if any question just reach out to Ben and we can it take it from there I am aware of that. Uh, g l let me take maybe just one and minute you to keep give you a saying that example. You, and you keep saying that you have no bandwidth and you haven't got to it in a couple of months and all. Are you going to be able to stick with this? Because no, no, you're no, no, touching no. a really very uh, tricky area so that no the, one understands. The, the stuff I'm doing at the moment, the simplification path, is not changing the behavior. It's making it easier to understand that. So I'm, I'm hoping to be able to do that without doing too much uh, harsh. Why, where we... The, the, what you mentioned is when we start actually tackling delegator itself. And I've already tackled some of these things. I don't have no bandwidth. I don't have the bandwidth to start the whole new testing thing. Uh, there's one interesting example is the whole PCI read bases, bridge bases. We don't read the bridge bases at all today, uh, initially, because if we do, we break all those platforms. We want to ruin uh, yeah, we have things, so. right? And <laughs> because of a weird test that Yingailu added once in the code without any description or nothing understandable at least of why that test is there. And nobody so far has been capable of telling me why. It's there and it's, and it's breaking that and we don't know why. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Let me thank Benjamin for presenting. <laughs>
So NTB uh, stand, stands for non-transparent bridge. Uh, it allows, it is, a, it is a point to point bus allowing two systems to communicate with each other. So here it allows, so here it allows two, Okay, so here it allows two host systems to communicate with each other. Uh, so, th so the NTB uh, is is functionally functionally similar to a transparent bridge, except that uh, the address domains on both sides of the bridge are are independent. Uh, and and the devices that are present in the downstream. Uh, downstream path of the bridge is not visible to the upstream path of the bridge. And the NTB uh, device also exposes a type zero configuration space header, uh, which is similar to that of an endpoint. Whereas the, the root ports and the switches usually have a type one configuration space header. Uh, so NTB is implemented by some of the Intel processors, uh, AMD processors, and, and there are some switches which actually implements uh, NTB. So the, the NTB uh, provides three primary constructs using which the hosts on either side of the bridge can communicate with each other. Uh, one is the scratch pad registers, the doorbell registers, and the memory windows. Don't they also usually have DMA engines? Uh, sorry? Don't they also usually have DMA engines? The, the NTB controllers? Yeah. Uh, some switches has DMA, uh, but I'm not sure the, the generic NTB Linux frame, framework, how far it supports okay. an NTB in the switch. I think that's something we have to explore. So scratch pad registers, so the scratch pad registers is, it's a normal register space provided by the NTB to each of the hosts. Uh, so the scratch pad registers are both readable and writable from both sides of the bridge. Uh, so the scratch pad registers are used by the applications, which uses NTB to share control or status information between, between these two hosts. Uh, there are two parts of scratch pad. One is the self scratch pad and the other is peer scratch pad. So each host here has its own scratch pad, which is the self scratch pad. And it should also be able to access the scratch pad of the other host, which is the peer scratch pad. And then there is, they have doorbell registers. The doorbell registers are used to send uh, interrupt from one end of one side of NTB to the other side. So basically the host one can actually interrupt the host two using the doorbell register. And then there are, there are memory windows. Uh, so the actual transfer of data between the two hosts will happen <coughs> using this memory windows. So these are the primary constructs using which uh, both the hosts can communicate with each other. So now uh, let's get, get into the details of how I built uh, NTP functionality using an SOC. Uh, so in order to build NTP functionality in SOC, the SOC should be capable or should, should implement multiple endpoint instances. <coughs> so here the SOC actually implements two endpoint instances and the hosts which communicate with each with each other should be connected to uh, one endpoint instance that is present in the SOC. So once you have a hardware with this configuration, the endpoint one and endpoint two controllers can be configured such that a transaction from one host can be routed to the other host. So in order to configure the endpoint controllers, uh, they have the address translation unit which is the inbound address translation unit and the outbound address translation unit. So all the incoming transactions should happen via base address registers. So if a host one, if host one has to access any region within the SOC, it has to be using those base address registers. The inbound address translation unit can be configured such that access to bar will actually reach a target in the local interconnect. So in the case of normal endpoint applications, the address translation unit will be configured such that the base address register, uh, any access to base address register will reach the DDR or memory space or to a peripheral register space. But in the case of NTB, the address translation unit should be configured such that access to bars actually reach the 
outbound region of the other endpoint instance. And Sorry? And the other way around. Uh, I didn't get it. Oh, sorry. Just move on. Uh, yeah, correct. <laughs> so, um, so once the transaction hits the outbound region, the PCI controller will route the transaction to host two based on your outbound address translation unit configuration. So for implementing uh, NTB in a configurable uh, PCI endpoint, so all the primary constructs that is used in building an NTB should anyways be used. Which is, which is the scratch pad registers, the doorbell registers, and the memory windows. Uh, however, we add a new construct or new region, which is specially required when you want to make a configurable PCI endpoint behave as a uh, NTB. So the, the controls and status region, it has the register space for configuring the endpoint controller. So here, uh, the endpoint controller can initially write some of the informations like num of number of memory windows supported, the scratch pad offset, et cetera, which can be read by the host. And the host can write to this region whenever it has to configure the outbound address translation unit. So, so there are five regions, uh, the control and status regions, which is specific to the configurable PCI endpoint, the self scratch pad region, the peer scratch pad region, uh, the doorbell region, and the memory windows. So there are five regions, and we have only six, thir six 32 bit bars. So if, if a platform supports 32 bit bars, then we could assign one region, uh, we could assign uh, one region for every bar. Is, is, this is the details of a specific implementation, right? I mean, technically, a non transparent bridge can be different. It just happened to be the one you're talking about that is like this, right? Uh, like what? Well, organized this way. Uh, there is no standard for that, is there? Yeah. Th there is no standard, so you mean the, the, the regions? Yeah, yeah, so the, the specific details of the organization of here, I mean, yeah. So, yeah, so. Sorry, yeah, and the styles of scratch patches and the type of interrupt it generates and the number of memory windows, whether it's privilegeable or not, whether there is a DM Correct. engine or not. I mean, all those things are completely implementation specific. Correct. All those are implementation okay. specific. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah, yeah so, uh, so, so, so these are like the basic, so if you want to have a basic NTB functionality, you will have these regions. Obviously, there are more additional regions, additional functionalities which are uh, specific to some of the hardware. Uh, for example, some uh, hardware have memory space region which is optional, etc. Um, yeah, so so we have five regions and, and six 32-bit bars. And uh, if a platform supports only 64-bit bars or, or if they have bars for some reserved purpose, then we won't be able to have uh, then we, we won't be able to allocate bars for, for all these regions. So we combine these regions in such a way that we don't break the functionality while making sure that uh, access to one host doesn't access a region that it shouldn't access. So the bar zero, uh, so the control, control and status region and self scratch pad region are combined to be mapped to bar zero and you give a separate bar for for the pure scratch pad region, uh, th for the doorbell region and memory window one, you give bar two. So these are like, like the basic, at least three bars you need to, to implement the, the NTB functionality. And if there are additional free bars, you, you could have additional memory windows. Uh, so, so here, as I said, I combined the control status region and the scratch pad region. Uh, and the inbound address translation unit is configured such that uh, any access to bars will reach the control status region and the scratch pad region. So the, the control status region and the scratch pad regions are memory that are actually allocated in the DDR. Um, so the, the scratch pad of, yeah. So, so the scratch pad of one host is also the pure scratch pad of the other host. So we use the second bar to access the pure scratch pad region. So whenever the host one has to access the control status region or, or the scratch pad, it will use bar zero 
if it has to use, if it has to access the scratch pad, it will use bar zero with a appropriate offset. And similarly, if host two has to access the pure scratch pad region, it will use the bar one. Same thing for the other host also. So here we model the control status region, the self scratch pad region, and the pure scratch pad regions. So for, so now we'll model the doorbell registers and the, and the memory windows. Uh, for the doorbell registers, we'll use the MSI or MSIX functionality. Um, so generally, uh, while the host, say, say for example, we are using this endpoint connected to this host, uh, while this host initializes the endpoint two device, uh, it will, uh, initial, while initializing, it will populate the MSI capability with the MSI, MSI address and MSI data. I mean, there is, for MSIX, there is a separate table, but it's, it's the same mechanism. So when, the, when this endpoint has to raise and interrupt to the host two, it will take the MSI data and write to the MSI address, both configured by host two during, during the initialization. So now for the NTB case, instead of uh, the endpoint writing the MSI data to MSI X, X address, we'll make sure the host one can directly write the MSI data to MSI X address. So when, when, when during the initialization process, uh, the, the endpoint function driver that runs in this SOC will reserve uh, memory for MSI and memory, memory window because we have combined the doorbell and memory window one regions. So, so, so it will just reserve some region in the outbound address space and configure the inbound address translation unit so that bar two is mapped to this region in the outbound address space. Now once the host comes and initializes the endpoint device, it will populate the MSI or MSI X capability with the address and data. So once the host has configured the MSI table, it will, it will write a command in the control and status region that it has configured the MSI table. So only after, so, so only after this, the host here writes that the MSI table has been configured, the software running here will know that the MSI capability has valid address and data here. So once the host two writes a command to configure that it has configured the MSI capability, the function driver will configure the outbound address translation unit so that the, the address space reserved for MSI X is mapped to an MSI address. This looks weird. <laughs> Kishan, for, I mean, uh, I think uh, the, qu what the question I have for you is that, A, how does it map to the current endpoint uh, subsystem? And second, I think uh, for the sake of timing, I think you should seek feedback from the audience because I don't think you can, uh, I think if you, the time you, you have to, to ask the contra controversial question you want sorted out because I think we are uh, running out of time. I think it's built on top of the endpoint that you have patches uh, ready. Yes. You, you do need to make sure that uh, the MSI X table that is as a host and I look, I see a device MSI X table uh, in um, behind a bar that never goes away. You, I don't used to talk about it being remapped or something. That ne must never go away. The host, mm -hmm. the, the, the host never finish configuring MSI. The host might poke at the table to enable disable MSI X at runtime. The host these days can actually pop new MSIs at runtime in MSI X table. It's perfectly possible, and we have uh, APIs to do that. So okay, so so the host actually can write to this command region as and when it configures the, the, the <coughs> MSI table. Uh, so when, whenever you do something like an uh, alloc IRQ or something, I think that's when the MSI tables or, or, or the MSI capability gets configured. So I've tried to understand what problem you're trying to solve here. You're trying to so I'm trying to open an outbound window from the device to the host that is encompass all the possible MSI addresses so you can actually write to them? Uh, correct, yes. Okay, I see. Yeah. So, so you could do that lazily. You could check at the point where you're trying to send an MSI that the table doesn't have the address you're trying to send and then reconfigure the table. <laughs> you yeah, don't so so, so yeah. the idea is 
to for basically the high level idea is for host one to interrupt host two and we use the MSI capabilities that is present in this SOC. Yeah, so you, you don't necessarily need that uh, comment that tells you that uh, MSIs have been configured. I mean, you could perfectly well uh, verify whether the MSI you're trying to send fit in the current table you have, and if it doesn't, so, then reconfigure the So when the this table. host actually tries to interrupt the host to the software or, or anything here is, is totally transparent. It, it really doesn't, uh, uh, it doesn't really uh, snoop or, or do anything. Once it does all this mapping, the host one can directly interrupt the host two by just writing to the base. It, which I must, what, what I'm saying, yes, but it first needs to look into the table to figure out where to write. Uh, so, so it, so this one doesn't has has to write. All it knows is it has to write to this region, it should, and it should say write uh, uh, for that. Region. So, and and you would have sure. No, no, let, what, I mean, let me just quickly make sure I understand. It's a magic write that the hardware will turn into an MSI, or is it just the actual write of, of the MSI message that is, happens it, to be mapped? It is actual write of the exactly. MSI. Exactly, exactly what I'm saying. So you need to make sure that the outbound, you have to create an outbound region in one, in this one. that covers all the address space that you need to cover all the MSI X addresses of two. So that's what it's, it's done. But doing. you don't need that comment to do that. You can do that lazily. Because when you want to so send, so you can't you can't really map an ent entire address space because this address space is is really limited. Sure, but uh, th thankfully uh, the host usually will be very nice to you, and most of the MSI is going to be very close to each other, all of them. So, but the point is, you don't need that command that tells you I've configured the MSIs. You 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 know that you have or not yet configured the window, and at the point where we want to send an interrupt, you can check very pretty easily whether that you that address, which you have to pull out of the table, uh, fits in your current window. And if it doesn't, then you reconfigure the window. Um, does this mean that host one needs to know the um, host two's MSI uh, table uh, in terms of uh, you know, offs? So, the so the address, it doesn't have to, because all it access is this. And you would have done the mapping from here to here and here to here. So that's a hardware mapping. Right? No, this is so. So this is the function driver, NTP function driver running in this SOC, which configures this to this. But it doesn't. So when when it initially initially comes up, it doesn't know which address this has to ma be mapped to. That will happen only after host two has initialized. Only after host two has initialized the MSI capability. So yeah, but the MSI the MSI capability is in the bar, right? So the MSI table, the MSI X, sorry. So the MSI X table is somewhere in the memory of host one. Correct. Uh, somewhere in the memory of this SOC, not necessarily host one, because both share the same DDR and stuff. So wait, wait, wait. We, we're talking about the case where one interrupts two. Correct. Okay. Okay. Which means the MSI X table that we're interested in is the MSI X table of one. Host two. It's host two. two. The one two. is interrupting two. Yeah. Yeah. No. One. <laughs> yes, so which means it's returning so MSI so sent by a host one, which means we are talking about the MX so uh, so table of one. No, no, no. no, 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 no. <laughs> yes. No, no. no forget, forget about the, the host one part. So you, ha you consider only host two an endpoint device. Consider only a host. MSIX table is in the endpoint. Correct, correct. You consider, you forget about this part. You have a host connected to an endpoint. Yes. So, so the MSI table for this endpoint in the endpoint is in endpoint two. Yeah. So and this one does not know about this. Oh, I, I thought the endpoint was host one through your non-NT non-transparent bridge. No. So, so if you look at the entire picture, the MSI X table will some somewhere be in the DDR. Which or host one, X, which is what I'm saying. No, no, no. There is the, there is only one SOC. <laughs> That, that, so this is like one SOC which has two endpoint instances. Oh gosh, I see. It's yeah. not a separate device. <laughs> the picture confused me to no end. Sorry. All right, I get. I uh, yeah 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 yeah. Sorry, I get it. Uh, no no, it's not. I was. I just did not completely understand that this is what all inside the one SOC right. that pretends yeah. to be the NTB bridge, and I thought this was a bit of the host there. Mm. Yeah. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. No, okay. I, 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 I'm getting it now. Sorry. Absolutely. I apologize. Yeah. So, so with this configuration, um, <laughs> so host one will be able to uh, ring the doorbell of of host two. Same thing. The other direction also. Host two will also also has the similar configuration using which it can interrupt the host one. Uh, so, okay. So. Uh, and and similarly for for memory window, uh, the host two after initial, so this is my current design. Um, maybe this is something we could discuss. Mm -hmm. But host two uh, will allocate memory, and then it will uh, again populate the address in the control and status region, and then it will write a command to configure memory window. So once it writes uh, a command to configure memory window. The software running here will configure the outbound translation unit so that uh, the space reserved for memory window is mapped to an address that is actually programmed by the host two. So the and so for accessing memory window one, host one will write to bar two with an offset, using which it will access the buffer in the host in the other host. So same thing applies for 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 other memory windows. So similarly, it will during the initialization it will reserve memory for for other memory windows, configure the inbound address translation unit. The host driver comes up, it allocates memory, uh, MW2, whatever, MW3, MW4. Uh, it uh, writes a command to configure memory window. At that time, the outbound address translation unit of this will be configured so that it's mapped here. Uh, so this is the uh, overall so software architecture. Uh, on the top is the host side. Uh, architecture and the bottom is the endpoint side architecture. On the host side, there is a on the host side there is a NTB framework uh, which abstracts the various NTB hardware and and also the various NTB applications that is currently present. So right now uh, this supports uh, Intel NTB hardware, uh, AMD, and and also there is a there is a switch. Um, it supports NTB NetDev application which actually creates an Ethernet interface. Uh, over over PCIe NTB, uh, and there are like other NDB tools which can be used for your normal debugging, perf and ping pong, are, are, are like other simple tools. Uh, on the endpoint side, there is a PCIe endpoint core, uh, which abstracts the various uh, endpoint devices, and and right now it has one function driver, which is the PCIe EPF test. Um, so so right now um, PCIe design. PCA Designware, Cadence, uh, and there are there are like few other vendors who uh, actually uh, support PCI endpoints. <coughs> uh, so so for for adding this support, I have to add a new uh, hardware driver, which is NTB Hardware EPF. And on the endpoint side, I have to add a PCI EPF NTB function driver. Uh, there are some modifications to the endpoint core because now the endpoint function device will now have reference to two. Uh, endpoint instances, and also there is a new ops basically to map uh, MSI table to the or map MSI uh, to the outbound address translation unit. So once uh, this part is done, uh, we could have two independent hosts uh, connected to a multi uh, endpoint instance supported SOC. We should be able to use uh, any of these applications to transfer data from one host to the other host. Sorry? Can it be done with the hardware that is supported today? Uh, the cadence and design web. Yeah. This, yeah. So, so the endpoint uh, devices, so there, there are like few few other uh, endpoint devices. There is rock chip, there is layerscape. Uh, and these are like IPs used by multiple other vendors like Samsung, TI, everyone uses uh, one of these uh, cadence or, or synopsis IPs. I should ask you to summarize, and if you have questions for the uh, yeah, um, I, ha I have like I have like one slide more, yeah. maybe complete. Uh, yeah, so so as part of this uh, as part of this work, I'm also adding uh, device tree support for for endpoint function. So previously, the endpoint function devices are 
are cre were created using configFS. So for creating an endpoint function device, you used to create something like this. Uh, but now for, uh, so the, the problem is you, you generally uh, link a function to, to, to one endpoint instance. Now we have to link a function to two endpoint instances and a better, and the device in my opinion was a, was a better representation uh, for, for, for these kind of use cases. So, um, so the root should be a EPF bus which has the PCI EPF bus compatible property. Uh, so the EPF bus driver will uh, create endpoint function device for each of the subnodes. Uh, here I have one uh, one NTB function device. So, so we have a single uh, NTB node. Uh, the compatible here will find or will bind the endpoint function device to the endpoint function driver, and EPCS will have the P handles to the PCI endpoint instances. Since it's an NTB, it should have. Uh, P handle to two two PCI endpoint instances, and then EPC names, which is uh, basically corresponding to the P handles that is in P e EPCS, and then vendor ID, device ID are what you can actually program uh, in the configuration space header. So these uh, five properties will be common to all endpoint function devices. The SPAD count, the num number of memory windows and memory window size are actually specific to a uh, are specific to uh, NTB. Uh, we still use uh, configFS to uh, to start the endpoint controller to to actually tell that it's ready to establish a link. So this is because we can't have uh, a function driver start an endpoint instance because that will break a multiple function endpoint devices. Have you thought at all about extending that to support an arbitrary number uh, of endpoints uh, rather than just a point-to-point -point connection? Having, uh, so that means having more sets yeah. of peer so, Yeah, so it's like ports, it's like multiple ports is yeah, what you yeah, actually yeah. mean. Uh, so this design actually, uh, how I really intend this to be done is for us to support multiple ports, it should actually use multiple physical functions which is actually supported in the, in the PCA specification. So, so there, are, there are like advantages and disadvantages. One of the primary use cases for us and also the advantages is we should be, we could provide isolation between um, different uh, devices because because when you have a multiple physical functions, then you give a separate uh, ID to each of these devices. Okay, and another quick one. Uh, I, I'm going to the last one to adv advocate against a device where you have more or less in the uh, The and I don't like configFS that much, but it is our standard for doing that sort of stuff. It is in USB gadget and it is now in, on, on PCI endpoint. Um, I don't mind having a device tree representation that is equivalent and bijective, uh, so that you can go back and forth with complete equivalence between a device tree representation and a config FS representation. In fact, it will be probably useful for some of the USB gadget stuff as well. Uh, but I still think the same thing should be doable both ways. Yeah, um, I agree. So you should so be able to create correct, a seam link agree. across correct, and points agree. on the on, on agree, configFS. Agree. And yes, I, I agree. So yeah, I agree. Okay, cool. Um, so why is both the endpoints visible to a single uh, OS instance? Uh, why is both endpoints visible to a single OS instance? I mean, the, f the yeah, but my point is that the host one should only be seeing its endpoint. No, no, no. So this is this is not in host, right? This is in the endpoint. This is in a multifunction endpoint instance. You are building an NTB function driver or NTB function device. So an NTB function device has two pa two two sides. Each side will be connected to a separate endpoint instance. Yes, but my understanding, maybe correct me if I'm wrong. Where does this data structure go? It goes to the OS, right? No, no the OS of the SOC. But the, the, the SOC that's acting as a non-transparent bridge. Yes. So you have the two hosts, they are connected to a single SOC that has two ports. Yes. And that, and it, that SOC plays, a, act as a bridge between the two hosts. And this is the description that the DT of that SOC yes, tells correct. it to connect those two ports together to, to make a, an NTB out of them. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Unfortunately, I think we need to wrap yeah, so it up. <laughs> I just would like to ask you uh, uh -huh. if it's possible before uh, 
merging upstream the endpoint uh, implementation driver, it would be nice if you test it across all um, uh, endpoint controllers uh, implementations to make sure that the design is valid. Okay, uh, because okay, I mean, there are, I know yes, in the yes. past there are. All is a very big word, but at least. <laughs> <laughs> at, at, yeah, at least uh, maybe the, 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 the most common one. I mean, I suppose design where is probably yeah, the so most I common could, one. I could test I mean both in design where and cadence. Yeah, so the I've, I've tested this in mm. cadence. So 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 I could connect two endpoint, two, two hosts connected to a Jacinto 7, which has like two uh, endpoint instances. And then I was able to use the NTB NetDev to communicate between this and this using standard ping tools and, and IPERF tools. But just to make sure that the design you can implement it on, on different. Yes, yeah. 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 So in, in, in the grand scheme of things, uh, the main thing that could see being problematic would be things like a number of windows. So if the architecture is reasonably flexible on how many windows you have, for example, that sort of thing would probably is a kind mm -hmm. of sort of getting away. Uh, I wouldn't it past put it past somebody to make one where the whole MSI stuff has to be hardware generated. But that's the kind of problem that let's solve it when we have to. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I reckon those, those two seem to be the most common uh, out there, so it makes sense to focus on, on them. Yeah, so I'll, uh, I, I targeted to post the patches before, before uh, LPC, but wasn't able to, but I should be able to in a couple of weeks, but I have all this, all this working. Uh, yeah, so some of the references for, for the work. Any questions, man? Just, we are really running out of time, guys. So I mean, quickly. Uh, what, what's your next plan to 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 build up with the router? Uh, sorry. I, I I mean, just the transfer to peer to peer. You don't you don't need to do that that way. Just the one one master and one slave. But 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 I think uh, you do that. Uh, maybe you sh you want to have a uh, switch that means a lot of, a lot of host uh, could plug in the uh, pl plug in the your S your your chip and uh, and uh, how do we think about that? because that will be more complex more than so 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 in my opinion it should be like a repeat repeat of of this uh, device tree node multiple times so every time you use use a uh, endpoint instance, it means it will use one physical function of, of that endpoint. You just replicate it multiple times. So as, as many physical functions as is there, you'll be able to bind uh, an NTB device to that. Um, I think, guys, I think we should wrap yeah, yeah. it up. I'm sorry we can take it uh, offline, and while well, I invite you to discuss further on when is the uh, quarter to one, I mean, for the PCI, uh, BOF and uh, to talk to us, I mean, to maintain us everybody in the room about outstanding topics and what you would like to discuss given that the conference is still ongoing. And last but not least, thank you very much for uh, showing up and uh, for uh, making this happen. So thank you very much to the speakers and to everybody who attended the micro conference. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs>